All right, why don't you tell the people who you mm. are? I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. <laughs> yeah, the, dude, yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> From the day you were born, I hated you. I was a bitch. Like, I was, even back then, I was shitting in my pants. I hear teenage girls do that. Chase, I realized I was an, an idiot. I've been telling you that for years. I suck dick for crap. I'm a genie in a bottle. You got to rub me the right way. I'm going to rub that bottle. <laughs> What's to love about LA, Chase? Gas is free. Food is free. Drinks are free. Yeah, like foresight. Yeah. That's like foreskin. I had mine removed. You're still there. Have you ever seen my penis? Washed in uh, monument. Significantly less hairy as well. Your wife calls you idiot yeah that's love man simp yeah whatever you want babe i mentioned that we have a sister but since when i have a problem i'm not wearing pants right now so christian guzman was your first yeah yeah he was also mine bing bong bing bong bing bong Woohoo! You, you were trying to find the g-spot too i still haven't found it i'll show you later no please All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Don't Be Sour, the most family-friendly podcast in the world. This one, extra especial, big number 18, with the mildly less attractive and significantly less funny brother, Mr. Chase Tuning. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, he is my brother, flesh and blood. What's up, dude? Welcome to the show. You forgot the significantly less hairy as well. Yeah, yeah. The, dude, yeah. yeah I... I yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of like really good traits from from dad, like being really funny and stuff. But like you definitely got his back hair and whatnot. <laughs> What's up, man? Welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, man, Duke. Stoked to be here. You want to do a shot? Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, Avion, fancy stuff, dude. While, while we're pouring Avion. this up. Avion. Have some dude. culture. Have some culture. Samsonite, why don't you tell the people who mm. you are and what you do? Well, uh, I've known you for about 33 years now to the day. Happy birthday, Max, by the way. Yeah, you were filming this yeah, on my on birthday. birthday. Everyone would be really nice to me. Uh, uh, yeah, so, big bro, oldest of three. Uh, I live in L.A. now. We've come a long way from being, you know, Virginia boys. Yeah. Still love me a good tequila shot. What do you, what do you, what do, you do in life? I do this. I'm a podcaster. Podcaster. I'm a podcaster, and I own a podcast production company. Well, you're in my house now, Kimosabi. So, cheers, bro. <laughs> Bienvenido y feliz cumpleaños. All right. Uh, Chase speaks Russian, so da. It's dien rajdenya. It's neom rajdenya. God, it tastes like an inside of an asshole, dude. That's so bad. I love Avion, but honestly, I love their Blanco more. I don't know. This is like this is like fancy shit. That's not bad. Ugh. So a lot of people don't know that. Uh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What? I'm the captain now. Okay, what's up? So we're going to take a shot of yours. Take a shot of mine. What is this? Butt juice? It's Ke a, ketone IQ. This, from one podcaster, one, uh, one podcaster to another, this is my secret sauce. I do these before pretty much every podcast now. Brain juice, you're not going to like it because you don't like really anything. I don't like stuff that's healthy for you. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's exogenous ketones. What you so in about 10 minutes, you're going to be like, ooh, feel good. Feel what? really good. Yeah, yeah. It does brain stuff. It's science. You know, it's is this really. legal? Uh, in 14 states. I'm not gonna lie, Chase, that tastes like pure gasoline. Yeah, basically it's tequila. Oh, you know, some that tasted shittier than the <laughs> Avion, bro. Sometimes, Max, we have to do things. Dude, that we don't why? Like. Okay, dude, why is so. Un okay, okay, this might be a dumb question. Mm. Why is so everyone so anti sugar? Like, for example, this tastes like ass. Mm -hmm. Okay, tastes like ass. Whatever the benefits. You don't like ass? Why wouldn't they. Dude, what I do in my, my private time is, uh, is my, up to me, but like, why wouldn't they just make this taste good? Well, because you don't want to add all the extra crap. That's the whole point. Get that coin out of my face. You only want things that are good for you, especially if it's going to your brain. Yeah, but I'm saying, why can't they make it taste good? Yeah, you know, you can. Anywho, my big brother. A lot of people don't know. I, a lot, okay, if you've been following me for a long time, you might know that I have a, a big bro. But people don't really know. I've been following you for a while. Yeah. yeah. People don't really know about, about like kind of like my family beyond me because mm -hmm. I, I don't vlog. I don't like talk about a lot of uh, family members, people don't really know that I have a sister or some people do, but- Since when? What, you got a sister? What? Yeah, I know. Shit. So it, it's, uh, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of wild. And, and the re, you know, we're, we live in different parts of the country. Chase lives in California. Los Angeles. And that's where you're gonna stay? You know, for now, it's treating us really well, me and my wife. Uh, you know, we, we don't like to say this is our forever spot anywhere. We're kind of the, you know, the world will take us where it needs to take us kind of thing. But I can't complain, man. It sucked for the first year, like hated it. After that, I fucking love it. We both love it. What's to love about LA, Chase? It's a beast, man. It's a beast. It will chew you up and spit you out. 
but I love the challenge. It's so, I mean, you know, we're both from the same spot, like small town kind of growing up. You used to like the Southern charm, Southern hospitality. People hold the door before you say hello, look you in the eye the first year, like nobody give a shit about anybody there. So I'm used to that day to day interaction of just people being good human beings. Uh, but until we got assimilated and really found like our community and kind of uh -huh. just, it's like when you go anywhere, right? You walk into a, a new situation, new relationship, new job, you move, you're bringing a lot of like preconceived notions and expectations, whether you realize it or not. And we definitely were because we're both from Virginia and both from the East coast. So like the South and East coast definitely have their own kind of day to day persona. Yeah. West coast is totally different. California is totally different. LA is way different. So until we were kind of like, all right, you know what? We just got to surrender to the mother that is LA. And now it's fantastic. The best line I've ever heard about someone saying or describing LA is stupid. Well, that second to best, uh, we were out one night as one is and having some shenanigans. This guy turns in the middle of the street and just looks down. I think it was in Santa Monica. And he's just like, God, LA sucks. <laughs> yeah. I love it. That is the best description of Los Angeles. It sucks. I love it. That's what he said. Yeah. I, f I feel like LA, you know, it's, it's so expensive, right? But I guess something I enjoyed, I, I lived, if people are, are new to listening, uh, Chase and I lived in like right outside of Washington, DC and Northern Virginia, where it is very expensive. Similar, probably living. I lived then in DC. Right, 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 right. Okay. So, um, similar living costs to LA, right? Uh, some bits, you know, like restaurants and like, go, like going out life in LA is definitely more, but overall cost of living. I mean, like housing, food, coffee. Comparable, comparable. It wasn't a huge culture shock. I wasn't coming from Roanoke, Virginia, yeah. straight to LA. I'm like, God damn, takes $18 for a cheeseburger. But you know, it's like, it's not cheap. Well, see, one of the mindsets that I had when I was in DC, I was, you know, everyone was like, oh, it's so expensive, whatever. And I kind of had, I, I believe it's, uh, what is it, Beyonce, that's like, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. She's talking about DC <coughs> because, you know, if, it, if I can support myself in the most, yeah, one of the yeah, most yeah. expensive areas, I, you know, and make it and whatever, I, I can make it anywhere. But see, I, later in life, Chase, I realized I was an, mm. an idiot because it's like, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to live there. Like, I don't have to live where it's super expensive. You know, if you have a job that like locks you in, mm. you know, uh, people go to Washington, D.C. because it's uh, government uh, jobs. Apparently the government's FBI, there. NSA. And, or so they say. Who knows, dude? Aliens. You know, George Washington's penis just. <laughs> what? Yeah, that giant, his giant penis. Oh, oh, It's, it's an exact replica, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Washington Monument, model. whatever you want to call it. And, um, but but like then I, I understand like, you know, some people like need to live there or maybe their mm. family's there, but. I still love DC. But like, you know, you, you work for yourself. Like, why do you choose to live in an area that's so mm. damn expensive? Well, the main reason we moved, packed up, literally sold all of our shit, packed up whatever we could in the car, drove across country, kind of like started a clean slate. Mm -hmm. So her and I, May, my wife, we both wanted to, we always have kind of talked about going to California. I used to live there, I lived in Monterey for like a year and a half, right after I left home. Uh, and then when she and I first kind of met, thanks to you, mm -hmm. which uh, we might get into, she was like, hey, fun fact, I want to live in California, basically LA. Mm. So she's like, if this is going to work out, I need you to kind of be on board. I was like, cool, lived there in California once before, I'm down, whatever. And I'm in the health and wellness space and LA is a very big hub for health and wellness and all that shit. And uh, I had just left my job at the end of 2017 as a clinical health coach, started doing my own thing. She was a nurse and wanted to go to school, wanted to go back to grad school to become a nurse practitioner. And she was looking at some schools in Virginia, DC, Texas actually, uh, UT Austin and USC. So we kind of just decided, all right, we're gonna go where was the best opportunity for her. Mm. And, Cause she wanted to start her next leg of her career. And uh, USC kind of like, like recruited her a little bit and they were just, it was a good opportunity. And plus we, like I said, always wanted to go to LA and she always wanted to live there. So like, screw it, let's go pack up the car. We went there for her first. She went to school. Now she's a family. That's a, loving, that's a loving man. Like, kind of like, you know, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, whatever you want, babe. Cool. I mean, to a certain degree, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to go. What? <laughs> just I, love <laughs> I love my wife. I love my wife. I love you. Don't hurt me. Um, and so I was like, yeah, cool. It was, like, it was an easy yes for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you want to go to school and I can do what I'm doing anywhere, you know, running an online coaching business and running a podcast. It's at the fine. Same All time. the money that I make, I'll just, uh, you know, spend 80% of it on the rent and everything. But um, yeah, I'm excited to go. Basically. Yeah. So we packed up the car, went out West. She went to school. She did her thing. And within about 
like three months of us being there, it just blew up for me in terms of just being in the hub yeah. of, I mean, just meeting so many people. And that's when I went from running my podcast, my show like online to doing it in person because I was just meeting so many more in meeting people in person. Um, and it was just so much more opportunity and it was a big, big challenge. Like straight up when we first moved there, the first like couple months was like the most rock bottom of my entrepreneur career. I, I bet. I mean, it's like, a, yeah, yeah. It was so difficult. Like I had a lot of like just dumb shit going on in my business and like just oversights that ultimately was fine. Uh, but also it was at that time she stopped working. She had stopped working maybe like the month or two before we left. And I kind of just like didn't have that over that like foresight that I should have about, Oh, what does it take to really support a family of two in a major transition, changing your life, moving across country and then supporting two people in a whole new state that ain't cheap. Yeah. A foresight. Yeah. That's like foreskin. Uh, I had mine removed. Is yours still there? <laughs> You're supposed to remove that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get that later. Yeah. Have you ever seen my Happy penis? Birthday, snip snip. Have you ever seen my penis? Uh, well, probably. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, up to a certain point, I'm sure we were like bathing together and that's weird. Yeah. That's kind of weird that like, I've they, seen your penis. You've never seen my penis. I don't think I've ever seen your wiener. I'm not wearing pants right now. <laughs> to be honest, I, I'd be fine with going the rest of my life. Without seeing your penis. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that, that's cool. I mean, the fact that you can make it out there and to be honest with the, the industry you're in with the, yeah. with the potters and everything, because every time I look up, I'm trying to like my whole day now, or I try to like schedule out podcast episodes. Right. And everyone, I, cause you know, just, you, you never know who's going to say yes. Right. You've got some amazing guests on yours, which we're going to dive into. But like, you know, everyone that you want to get on, they all live in L.A. Mm. Every celeb. It's like if you're a celebrity, you have to live in L.A. Unless yeah. you're Eminem, you live in Detroit. That's because he's keeping their entire economy alive. Yeah. Yeah. He's like he's a reclusive kind of man. Yeah. He just he stays in there. But, you know, L.A., you know, I guess it is what it is, dude. You're like one of the final people that have moved to LA and have not moved out of it. I think you oh, yeah. and this, like one other, one of our, my, our buddies named Javon, like that's like yeah, li yeah. every single other person I've known has moved to LA has been like, fuck this, I'm out. And that's funny, everybody I know who has moved there in the pursuit of the dream, right? Yeah. Cali, Los mm -hmm. Angeles, opportunity, Well, you gotta go fame. there, you, you have to like, you gotta put in the work. Like you, so I think people, like go there and then they're just like, yeah. I'm gonna walk down the street and uh, someone's gonna be like, I'm a director for uh, the next Marvel movie. You wanna be the yeah. star? Yes. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I mean, I knew it's gonna be work. I mean, I'm not afraid of work and I've worked for everything I've ever achieved in life, you know, my versions of success. I, and so I wasn't opposed to that, but yo, know, it has made me work in ways yeah. that like, I didn't even know I was capable of. Just like the grit and the showing up and the discipline and just, but on top of that, it's you have to like keep showing up every damn day, but then you also have to kind of always get out of your own lane and just look at what's going on because you will miss opportunities. You gotta head down, do the work to make whatever your thing is grow, but also it's just like staying so focused on one lane, you're gonna be missing so many opportunities because of yeah. what LA has to offer. I find myself talking to people, doing, the, doing things, whether it's like professionally, actually making me money or is gonna be like a stepping stone to another opportunity or just out of kind of like, you know, sheer enjoyment that are so far out of my job, which is why like when you say like, what do you do? Or when I tell people what I do, I, you know, I'm a podcaster, but what I actually do behind that Still, I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, what am I doing? It kind of <laughs> would just, piss me. It kind of wrap up this this L.A. intro that I didn't really plan on. I It's kind of, it almost would like piss you off because you almost have to work twice as hard to reap the same reward yeah, as yeah, someone yeah. else who, who lives somewhere else who maybe yeah. doesn't need to make as much, can put in like less effort than you, make the same amount of money or, oh, yeah. or like ever have to sp make more profit, we'll say, because they mm -hmm. have to spend a lot less. I'll tell you one thing, it is annoying whenever people from LA come to Texas, they're like, look at this house in LA, this would get you a shack. And I'm like, you can move. You, oh, don't, yeah. you don't have to live, you don't have to live there. When I come to Texas, I'm like, it's free. Everything's <laughs> free. Gas is free, food is free, drinks are free. Yeah, Chase, Chase has told me uh, how cheap our gas prices is about 800 times since we've, since we've been here. And I don't even have a car, so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, why don't we go back to the origin? How, how did yeah. we meet? Uh, I'll see, Max, when a man, Falls in love with a woman. Bing bong. Bing bong, bing bong. Woohoo. Chase and I, we go way back about, like I said, 33, 33 years. years. Why, don't, why don't we dive into our childhood? You want to know the very, like the origin story of you and me? 
You okay. know, I remember the very first day I, believe I met you. Eggs and sperm. You know, your nucleus. <laughs> Are we going to get a running tab of how many Nacho <laughs> Libre quotes? Uh, I remember the day you were born. I was four, like a little over four. Uh, and I, from the day you were born, I hated you. Well, yeah, because I, I think I, that was, mom told me a story. She like held me up after they cut my umbilical cord. And she's like, my favorite child. That's what she said. Look, why did you mom hate me? had a drinking problem, okay? Mom? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Look, mom says a lot. You're serious for mom a second. Mom says a lot when she's been drinking. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was very disgruntled because out of all places to run out of a blanket, the hospital mm. did not have any swaddling cloths, no blankets to wrap up your little fetus ass. And so they took my blanket, my favorite blanket. Yeah. It was like this periwinkle blue and yellow blanket, and they swaddled your ass. And I was just like... Not only is he coming into my world, taking us all new attention to my. I actually, blanket. you know, as as weird as a lot of times people can't remember, you know, before a certain age. I remember that moment, <laughs> and I they wrapped me up, and I remember looking at you, and I was like, <laughs> just like this, dude. <laughs> I think I did the like the suck it movement. I did. I was like, <laughs> suck it, Chase. You know, and um, all right. So I was born, yeah. and Chase and I lived. So we grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, which is if you don't know, the I Noke. Yeah, I always refer to Roanoke as the, like, I call Roanoke, I'm like, the, the boonies of Virginia. Oh, I think We like, literally lived in Boone's Mill. Like, yes. I, I, Don't tell people our address. Outside of Roanoke. Yeah, we lived, like, literally in, in, the, in the mountains. So yeah. um, I mentioned that we have a sister. Her name is mm. Brittany. She currently resides still in Virginia. Mm. Um, but our family, just to, I'll give you a little... A uh, little insight of everything before we kind of dive in, but like, so uh, our our dad and our mom split up when I was born. I never really know how to answer that. I never yeah, know yeah. like when m mom and dad you, had, broke. you were born because you were born in Roanoke. I was born in Richmond. I was born, Where, and they're okay, like, started. I want a divorce. Yeah, they're like, shit. <laughs> this is what I have to look forward to. I'm out. <laughs> look at these buck teeth, yeah. man. These big ass ears. Yeah, I was like four ish. Like I said, you had just been born. Yeah. So you remember the divorce? I remember. I remember the conversation mom and dad had when after that argument, the heated discussion, that's shortly after mom and dad went their separate, separate ways. They probably like had me as a, as a try to like rekindle the, the, the relationship. I've heard it's really, I've heard if your relationship is going through like a rocky mm -hmm. times, you have a kid and that usually solves everything. I think that's what it is, right? Well, still to this day, 33 years later, the bane of everybody's existence, <laughs> but you know. So, yeah. okay, but. That's okay. why it took mom 25 years to get remarried. So, she was scared of having another you. Yes, all right, so our, our mom and our dad separated when I was a wee little baby. When I was just, still, when I was just, you know, even back then I was shitting in my pants. And <laughs> Same my, my mom, <laughs> damn it, <laughs> my mom, our mom, I'm going to say my mom a lot, even though it's our mom. Yeah, you uh, forget that we're related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, hey, Chase, my mom called me. I'm like, bro, really? Yeah, your mom? <laughs> really? No way. So she moved to, like, we'll call it we'll just Richmond, Virginia, and, and dad. Because that's what it's called. Yeah, well, she didn't live right in Richmond. It was in, like, Short Pump and stuff. Just, I'm, I'm, uh, just shut up, Chase. Potato, so, potato. So we lived with our dad, and our sister lived with our mom in Richmond, which was yeah. about four hours like away. Three. Yeah. So Chase and I lived together until we were 10. Because they're like, well, boys stay with the boys, the girl go with the girl. That's right. So why don't you explain our childhood to the people? Get, paint, a, paint a picture, be as detailed as oh, you want. Well, it was the best. It really, really was. It was the best. We, you know, why? Because we didn't have this this damn technology and that the that, interweb that damn TikTok. polluting our minds. Yeah, we just ran amok every day. Our, we lived for a while with our grandparents. Our, our grandparents had a house on this big plot of land. I think it was like close to two hundred acres. Yeah, we, we okay. It's a paint a picture. We literally lived in. Okay, imagine our house. It's like a valley. Yeah, it, yeah, literally in a valley. So on the left and the right side of our house, or really in the front, it'd be technically the front yeah, and the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, just mountains yeah, like a it, big it, strip and then we were like the house kind of faced it was i'll put like a picture in the on the middle. screen from, from when yeah. i went to visit there so like like the front of the house which looks like the side you're facing a mountain face yeah. and then on the back there was a creek that ran through and another mountain face and then behind that we had this massive massive garden yeah uh vet vegetables fruits all this other shit and then right behind it there was another mountain and then there was the main road, and the other side was the main the main creek. Yeah, so we, um, we lived in the mountains. We lived in yeah. like the boonies, but there was we didn't have like our neighbor was close to one was like two miles away. We we literally were mountain boys. We so ran amok. We, we set fire to everything we could. Yeah, uh, use magnifying lenses to burn ants. Yeah, build so, forts. So explain kind of like our living situation. So we lived with our grandparents for a few years, um, maybe like four or five years. Um, I have no idea. Well, yeah, yeah. I guess 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say four or five years because yeah, I, yeah. I moved away. To, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. For about four or five years. And and why and why why is that? Well, our parents had just split up, so there was a lot of like life, household, family dynamics that I'm sure. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't part of the conversation. I'm sure our dad was trying to navigate. And shortly after they split, about like a year, maybe a year and a half later, he met who he remarried, mm -hmm. our stepmom. Um, and so he had like raising two children, a third away. He had himself had just gotten out of the military. He had a injury, got medically discharged. Uh, and so, I mean, he was navigating life in a big, big way and uh, just trying to like, Make shit work. Yeah, you know? and we, we didn't have, like, we don't come from money. I, I always try to explain my childhood in, like, finances. Mm. And because, you know, we literally lived in a, in a double wide trailer. Yeah, we eventually. Like, a home, double wide home. On the other side of the garden, they yeah, got a double so, wide. So I always, like, you know, we never were, um, you know, wondering where our next meal is going to come from. Mm. But it was, we lived a very, like, you know, how would you describe our I say this. financial decision? I I only know this now looking back because, you know, I'm an adult and I understand what it likes to like pay bills and survive and shit. Uh, I don't have kids yet, but I can only imagine. But I mean, I'm pretty sure you would say the same thing. I never wanted, for, I mean, other than like, you know, oh God, I wish I would have like a cool new toy or maybe like an Xbox or whatever. I eventually got an Xbox, but like I never wanted for anything. Yeah. Like I, I was, had food in my belly, roof over my head. And I just remember having the best time ever. Like with yeah. you, our sister, you know, any other friends that we would have, you know, literally you would just run amok and play and just like live off of the earth. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you make it seem like we were like actually lived in the mountains. Yeah, I mean. Well, we, we didn't even have, so when we first moved, so essentially we lived with our gr grandparents yeah. and then we got a double wide home delivered in two pieces on a tra on a trailer, yeah. like on a truck so delivered. a lot of land at the end of the field. Yeah, literally like imagine like a football field a, a length away from our grandma's house. Mm -hmm. We just plopped a house down, yeah. like literally like two pieces, put it together and we had a yeah. house. But even for the longest time, we didn't even have like a TV or cable because if we wanted to watch cable, we which would I forgot to walk it would, all the way down the field to go would, to grandma's yeah, would, house. Yeah, shit sprint satellite. to grandma's to watch yeah. TV. But for the most part, we just, we hung out outside yeah. every single day. We, I don't think we ever had less than like five dogs, three or four. And, and, and the dogs that we had were always, so it, it's really an unfortunate, I mean, it's, I guess it's good for us because, you know, we had such a great time with all these animals, but the, the reason we had, so we had, we really only had one dog. Every other dog was a stray. Yeah. Her, her name was Kayla. She was yeah. a German shepherd. RIP. Yeah. 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 And the other dogs that we had were just people would um, literally drive by. There's a little bridge by mm. our house and people would just dump their animals. Like yeah. they would just leave their dog. Our yeah. neighbor at the time moved away out of this log cabin and just yeah. left her dog there. I mean, it's Buster. Yeah. Yeah. Buster is light is a black lab. Yeah. And so these, these pinky sparky Tora <laughs> shaggy. Yeah, Shaggy. Kayla, Buster. All right, say Buster. Yeah. For for a minute, we had another. I don't know if you were the Beagle, this. right? The Beagle yeah. Harley. So so we we had, we had a another lot of dogs. Shepherd. Yeah, and and had a ton of dogs because people would leave them and we would just be like sure come on in. But like yeah. all of the dogs, I, I you know now I couldn't imagine doing this. Yeah. But then like our dogs were outside dogs. Oh, dude, they had the best life. Yeah, but but like they slept yeah. in this little like igloo. I'll put the a dog picture. Glues, like, the dog glues. Dog yeah, glues. Yeah, 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 yeah like yeah. on the on the porch. Yeah. But the dogs would just throughout the day, you, would, you wouldn't know where they were and you would just go outside and you would just scream, Kayla, come. And she would just come <laughs> sprinting down the mountains. You, Sometimes you, with like a deer leg in her mouth. Like, yeah, hey, no, no, like that, got, you know? it's, it's like, yeah. now I'd be like, oh, I should probably know where my dog is. But then like you, you you'd go, you don't know where yeah. the dog is. You would just yeah. scream, Kayla, come. And, and you would just hear like leaves after like a minute. And then she would just Now my vet's down. like, you know, you really should, uh, you should be brushing your dog's teeth every day. When you brush your teeth, you should brush her teeth. I'm like, fucking, you know how many times? I never brush Kayla's teeth. Yeah, no. She lived in the wild. That's what dogs do. So. Yeah, like, like Lily the Woods. But our childhood was, was, was sick, man. We really, um, I mean, we, we used to ride around on a lawnmower <laughs> that they would take the blades off of underneath and we would just, that they was like our four wheeler. Off. That was our, our hillbilly four wheeler. It was like a lawnmower that was on its leg out. And then we got this like sort of kind of almost not, not really like a tractor, but like a large lawnmower thing. When they got that, they took the deck off that one, took the governor off the engine. So we went to like fifth speed, fifth yeah. gear. We were flooring, dude. I'm going to, yeah. uh, I, I want to bring up a, a memory. I want to see if you remember this. I remember everything. Okay. I'm going to say, I'm going to say a phrase and you tell me if it sparks the, the thing and tell the story okay. of it. Um, genie in a bottle. 
<laughs> this is the first time Max <laughs> you, got banned from the internet. Do you, remember, <laughs> you remember this? We even talked about this at, like since that day. Okay, so so yeah. explain what Genie in a Bottle, what that reference is. Well, besides is. being uh, a smash hit by uh, God bless her, Christina Aguilera, um, was the line that Max felt compelled to use in an AIM chat room yeah. back in the day. And this is like, we had just Hold gotten on, people, people are probably too, okay, AIM, we need to explain what this is. AOL so, so, Instant Messenger. So an R... Our growing up was dial up internet. If you don't know what that is, literally, yeah. Mom, don't hang up. The, yeah, get off the phone. if you picked up the phone, it would cut the internet off. So we finally got internet at our house. Yeah. And I would go on these chat rooms. That's and, what the internet was. Yeah. And it would just be like, it'd be like, you know, 12 to 14 year old chats. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I would just go in and like, I you would just chat and yeah. I, would, I would get like, Online, you would get online relationships. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and okay, keep going. So and then you were, uh, I don't know, probably in hot pursuit of this. Uh, definitely not a forty-five year old man. In no, the, back uh, then they weren't older men, dude. No, they were definitely just young. I was, I was a hot twelve-year-old going after a hot twelve-year-old for sure. Tell me later what it's like living in your bubble. Okay, uh, but that was your line. And then somehow it got well. Yeah, got so, back that like uh, you you said that you're like I'm a genie in a bottle, baby. You got to rub me the right I way. Sa I said yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a genie in a bottle. You got to rub me the right way. I Which you I had no idea. What that was a pickup man. line. Yeah, I'm like, hey, other <laughs> other young person, other not 45 year old man living in his mom's <laughs> basement. He was like, yeah, you are gonna be a genie in your bottle. I'm gonna rub that bottle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I got banned. I got banned off the internet, and, and that yeah. kicked us off. The internet. We got, like, we got kicked off AOL. Not just like, it wasn't just like Max getting in trouble. Like the internet was shut off from our house. <laughs> yeah, they, they yeah, kicked yeah. us off. Yeah. We were like, off it was hardcore. the internet. Yeah and, yeah, and so I remember I was like, I think, so our grandma used to pay us like a penny. We would pick up these like giant like walnuts from these walnut tree. From the driveway, yeah. And I remember one time I was either doing that or mowing the lawn and Chase is like coming down the driveway, which is like a two mile long driveway. Literally. And he literally is like, he's like, you gotta rub me the right way. Good, good job, Max. Kicks off the internet, and I'm just like picking up walnuts, and I'm like, oh man. I, I thought we were Team Britney Spears. You're Christina. What the hell? Yeah, I, and it's, it's <laughs> bro. And uh, we you know we used to a lot of other cool memories. Chase and I would um, we would wrestle on top of like the shed. We I told Taylor the story this morning. Really? Yeah. What would we do? Well, so there's a shed that covered like, that got our lawnmowers and stuff. This is one of my favorite stories because. May, my wife, when she's like, when I do some dumb shit, she's like, what are you raised in a barn? I'm like, kind of. Uh, technically, it wasn't a full barn because it had an open door. But yeah. it was like a large, large shed, different storage sides. And usually only when it would snow, but other times probably, uh, we would climb up the back of it mm -hmm. and we would play this game, classic game. I'm sure everybody knows it. It's called Throw Your Brother Off the Roof. Yeah. Uh, and we, it, yeah. Okay, it was like, it's probably like seven feet tall, eight feet tall. Yeah. Like no more than 10, I mean, by 10, we'll call 10, it 10, yeah, 10, 10 feet. But it was on a slope mm -hmm. and it was on like a little hill. So like on the front side, definitely 10 foot drop. But like depending on where we would try to throw each other off, I mean, it's like a four foot yeah. drop. Yeah, I mean, we'd always try to throw each other off the front for sure. Yeah, for sure, that's bonus points. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so it would snow, uh, cause it's gonna soften the blow when you land. And we would just wrestle on top and try to throw each other off uh, until usually our grandma would open up the back door and go, y'all trying to throw each other off the roof again? <laughs> Stop that! And we would just, Lay down. Yeah, we would literally lay like, down and try to hide. She's not going to see us. She's not going to see us. We're wearing like bright blue snow gear and the white snow. Um, yeah, that passed many a day. Yeah, and right I mean, and, and another kind of like just childhood memory, just bringing back in, into the the memes is we had this uh, blue trailer. Like you would put, you would fill it up, you know, trailer you'd pull behind a car or something. But it we would, would go some, up into the woods, chop wood, and okay. bring it back down. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. but for some reason, we would they would store it in just the middle of our like our, our garden. Yeah, yeah. And Chase and I would sit in there with a magnifying glass, and we would like burn ants, and then we would try to like burn holes in our shoes and stuff, and then we would see like who can hold the 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 magnifying like beam of light onto the hand. Look at the scar. Is that a scar Look from scar? on Look that? Scar? That's crazy, man. And, and it that's, was that's brotherhood right there. It was a cool growing up. Like hurt yourself right now. Hurt yourself for me. <laughs> we I, I I had I had a blast like like growing up. It was the best. And then you know and then at, you left me. Yeah. So mm -hmm. at at ten years old, I left I left the coop mm -hmm. because so I would say that our childhood like dad it was a, a stricter home. Yes. Yes. And and mom was the like rules you'd go there and it was like the fun like the, the fun i can do it i'd go i got to watch rated r movies i could go watch like mortal Kombat mm. and stuff and have sleepovers yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and at one point i i moved away when i was 10 years old 
uh, my sister, our sister, um, <laughs> our sister at the time um, was kind of in a rebellious state. So mm. she was having the freedom at mother's. I hear teenage girls do we, that. We, we did the old flippy floppy. So well, you were there for a couple of years together. Yeah, I'd say like like a year or two. Because Brittany came down, uh, I, she came down, it was my 17th birthday. And so when you left, I was 14. So it was like three years. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Well, so, so like I left, how was that for you just being by yourself? Well, I mean, I'm sure you can imagine because at that point, our dad had kind of started his next endeavor of being an entrepreneur and yeah. opening up restaurants and coffee houses and stuff. And he, he was busy. He was a busy dude. Uh, and so, I mean, it was kind of like same, same, but different. Yeah. I mean, the school that I went to was right there across from the first coffee house. He was working there all the time. So it was our stepmom. Uh, and so like, I mean, I was like 14, 15. I was, you know, beginning to grow up a little bit and, you know about to then drive, getting a learner's permit. So I was kind of getting a little bit more freedom. So it was kind of a way. Um, but I mean, honestly, like lifestyle was about the same. I mean, I definitely missed my bro. And it was like an interesting transition uh, going from like having a sibling there all the time to like have fun with or occupy your time, especially when dad was really busy and like, yeah. you know, what are we going to do? Um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of just like just dove in to school, tried to just like make friends and You're like, fuck that guy. I'm whatever I'm out. Yeah. You know, the, the, I started working in the coffee house like full time. Yeah, it, the more that I think about it, it, it kind of it's kind of a shitty thing. I feel like I did because I feel like my only reasoning, like, uh, imagine dad, mm. the son coming to you and be like, "Hey, I want to go live with mom." And my reasoning in my head, I don't know, I don't remember why, yeah, like, what, what, what I said. what I told him, but in my head, it was just because like I have, I can have more, I can do cooler things than mom. There's no rules there, so right, I yeah. want to go live with mom. Like I, I can't. I never until like this conversation probably have, have like thought about like probably what that did to dad of being like one of your kids is like, I don't want to live here anymore. But it wasn't yeah. in, in, you know, it's one of those things like you, you, I was young and. I know how much it tore him up. Cause I, you know, being the oldest and like literally the one who can understand the most, um, you know, as like eight to 14 or whenever, yeah. you know, when you left. Dad would confide in me more and more. And again, because I think it was understanding a lot more what was going on. And like, I'm sure you know this, but he would tell me all the time. He's like, having my children apart from me is breaking my heart. Like it destroyed him. Like yeah. he didn't want it, but he didn't. He also wasn't the type of parent that was going to like, I'm going to force, uh, you know, an unhappy marriage to stay together. I'm not yeah. going to force children to stay here if they don't want to. They, I mean, we're all doing the best we can with the tools we have, right? And so at the time, it made sense to them to, all right, the boys are going to stay with dad, the girl's going to go with the mom, and then, you know, we yeah. swapped holidays and some summers and shit like that. Uh, but, I mean, I don't know. I don't have any memory of him telling me anything about that. But, yeah, I mean, I can imagine just reflecting back on, I mean, it probably stung. Yeah, um, and and I want to I want to save a lot of the the kind of the – we're gonna get in talking about dad yeah, uh, yeah. a little bit later, but um, something that like you know, m mom told me that I don't know. I mean, maybe you know, and you never maybe like talked to me about, but I didn't. Oh, you've been so, adopted. <laughs> <whole life>. <laughs> oh <laughs> god! I was like, I, I know. I, I, I realize I'm better looking than Chase. So I was like, I just don't understand why is he so <laughs> ugly. Um, so we grew up in a very religious household, Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. So we, what, yeah. what, what were, what were we? Christian. Christian. Okay. Yeah. So our father. We grew up in the Bible Belt. Yeah. So our dad, you know, we went to church every Sunday, every, every Sunday. Church um, was like happening, you know, uh, but I didn't know. But I got, you know, a little bit. So when sometimes I ask mom, I'm like, I'm like, hey, like, how was dad before, oh. like, like when, when you met him, right? But besides her just saying like, oh, like Max, you, you want to know how, why you have like so, so small legs? That was like your father had chicken legs and stuff. So yeah, yeah, I've seen the pictures I, right I, I literally get my, yeah. my chicken legs from him. Yeah. But I didn't know that dad had a huge, huge drug addiction. Mm -hmm. I believe it was like cocaine. Alcohol. Yeah, he, he was like an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. And like, like mom said at one point, like they, they like had to, she like didn't know if they could pay the electric bill because he was using money for drugs like yeah. or that. And this is, and then like yeah. probably this, and then they started having, you know, you and Brittany. And, um, I, I think like mom told me like the, the, she almost was like, I'm going to leave you if you like, don't turn like stop with this. Cause yeah. he was, he was addicted. He would smoke, 
um, you know, do drugs. Mm. He had a huge drinking problem. Oh, yeah. um, huge party guy, go out, yeah. you know, kind of like gone for a couple of days. Um, yeah, like and after, he turned, turned his life around. After they had you, well, actually, before they had you technically, you, they were pregnant with you, was when it was kind of like this come, literal come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Um, and then our grandparents, his mom and dad, his dad was still alive at the time, kind of had this like, it wasn't quite like an intervention, but you know, he was fully aware of the choices he was making in life and the path he was going down. And like, you know, he's like, yo, I either need to like be a family man and like commit to this shit, or I'm going to self-destruct and go down this other path. Yeah. So it was kind of like aware, but also the people in his life that mattered most were like, unfuck yourself. Um, and that's when they packed up, left Richmond, moved down to move in with yeah. his parents um, to kind of like, literally he had to remove himself from that life. It was almost like an intervention. I'm like moving yeah. back with my parents yeah, like yeah, yeah, to yeah. change my life because I, right. I, I don't I don't think I've, I ever saw dad drink. Oh, the did, only did he, time did, I, I have ever seen him drink. Would be like the wine at communion or something. Well, right? not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like uh, on, when he remarried our stepmom. They had like champagne at the ceremony, and I'm—I don't even think he drank like a glass. Yeah. Um, but after that, the entire rest of his life, never saw him drink. Wait, which is wild because the, the 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 tape that I, I I made the video of of yeah, dad yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. At, at the at dad's dad and mom's wedding, he literally was like he took a sip and he's like he's like oh we're like where's the bottle like he yeah, was like yeah. joking around but yeah. yeah. I didn't. I didn't know. I knew he drank before yeah. having me, but I didn't know he had a, a little like a little drug problem. Like, he told me, he's told me a lot of stories. Yeah, and it was kind of like, I don't know, like maybe like father son time when I mean I was about you know I guess 12, 13, 14, becoming a teenager, and um, for a very small period of time before they yanked me out of public school and not my choice, put me in private yeah. Christian school. I think he saw me maybe making some similar choices, like going down some similar paths. And it was kind of like one of those scared straight conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I literally, I never did anything, but like the friends that I was having in the community or the keep, company I was keeping, they didn't really like. And so I think that was a red flag for dad to be like, hey, let me tell you some shit that went down. Here's what happened. He would tell me stories of drinking, of drugs, of all these things. Not in like a like, yeah, this is like, this is your old man kind of thing, but just, Hey, this is what it I was like. I used to do some cool style. I used to no. party. It was like, don't ever fucking do this. Say, yeah. This is what I did. This is the choice that I made and the consequence because of it. And should you make a choice like this, this is probably a similar consequence. And this is one of the things I love most about him and, you know, him and our stepmom, but you know, definitely dad, like it was, that was the parenting style. It was never like do this, don't do this. I mean, there were definitely more rules and it was very yeah. conservative and religious, but it was always a choice. And he never hid anything from me, the truth of who he was and the man that he had evolved into. He just laid it all out for me. And again, maybe I think I just got a little bit more of this because I was older, could understand more. I mean, at that point you had already left. Yeah. So he would just tell me crazy fucking stories of the shit that he had done. And I was like, I don't really like that. Like, uh, he's like, Chase, if you ever want to smoke, let me know. We're gonna, he's got some dick for crap. <laughs> oh, he did tell you that story. Oh, cool. He's like, you want to smoke? Let's get a pack of cigarettes. We're going to smoke the whole thing. I was like, I don't want to smoke a whole pack of cigarettes. <laughs> you want to drink? We're going to get a bottle of tequila, sit down, finish it. I was like, oh, that sounds terrible. I don't yeah. want to do that. So he kind of like presented choices and consequences to me. And It's from, a bold strategy, Connor. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, it worked, man. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, it's, it was, it's an interesting, you know, raising. And so our entire... Would, you, would lineage be the right word of, of every male in our dad's House side? tuning. Every male in, in the male side of our dad's l history. Or genealogy. Genealogy. Yeah. There, you go, yeah. there you go. You're so much smarter than me, dude. I do have a master's degree. But every man went to the military. There's always been, in every generation of tuning, literally back to, we know for sure the Civil War, but we think America, like even American Revolution, but for sure Civil War. There's been a tuning in military service. Damn. Yeah. And uh, Chase also went. You went to the military. I did. And um, what did like? So the, the is in the army specifically. Army. army. Dad was in the airborne, right? Well, army. Airborne is a branch. Oh, it's like I, a, I don't. I don't know. A yeah. unit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He was in the his last unit. He was in was 101st Airborne, which is a, a station. Like I was in the 470th MI Brigade, 314th MI Battalion. 
you know, he was in the Rakasans unit, which is a unit of the 101st Airborne. So did, like every base you're on is a different unit. Did you go into the military because you wanted to go in the military? Or did you go in the military because uh, you were like, this is what the men do? Like dad went to the military. I want to go to the military too, whether it be to like continue this is what we, this is what tunings do. Yeah, the yeah. men go to the military, they go to the army or were you did, like, why was your reasoning? Here's the thing. So like I said, they pulled me out of public school and put me in this private Christian, Christian school, school. Yeah. from halfway through seventh grade or yeah, halfway through seventh grade through high school. And it was hard. It was a very challenging school, very hard school, very classical. Uh, in terms of the education, like we had to take Latin, like who the fuck takes Latin, Latin, yeah. Latin, Latinimus, Dorsimus, Maximus. <laughs> it's boring, really. It was part of my life. Um, and so anyway, so I was like, I'm not really like that kind of student, um, which is weird, like in college and shit, like I like really excelled and never studied. I just kind of got it later on. Um, but I had to fight to like just to like get high C's and B's. I was yeah. a very challenging curriculum. And then, you know, it got to like 11th grade and all my other friends, five of them, uh, very, very small school. Uh, how many, how many people were in your, in your like class? I don't like to brag, but I graduated the top six in my school, <laughs> top six in my class. And I dated half the girls in my class. <laughs> there were six people and two girls. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I dated one girl. The other one's my best friend. Um, and so it got to be that time where it was like 11th grade, junior year going to senior year. And everyone's like, oh, we got to apply to college and all this stuff. Long story short. I legitimately wasn't sure about my ability to get into college. Yeah. I mean, I, te I took the SATs and did all this stuff and I was like, I think so. So I was a little hesitant. I mean, which at that point is kind of like a little embarrassing. Like you're unsure, like, you know, people are getting acceptance letters and applying, like, is this even what I want to do? Can I do it? And then again, dad presented the option. He was like, hey, I know we got colleges coming up. I'd already toured like VCU and Virginia Tech. And um, let's, you know, let me tell you about my military career. Let's go meet with a recruiter. He was like, you're too smart for the army. Uh, let's go talk to the Air Force. And so again, he just presented all these options to me. And I'll never, and so I was like, okay, cool. Like, I know we've got this family legacy thing. I, you know, I think I could go to school, but also like, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was like originally gonna go to graphic design. I was like, I painted a watercolor in 10th grade. I think I'm an artist. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget the moment that I made the decision to join the army instead of going college. It was kind of that moment where dad was just like, all right, the timeline's getting close. I know that you need to make a decision. And he said it without saying it. Basically, it came down to like money. Yeah. Uh, he flat out told me, he's like, he's like Chase, oh man, if you want to go to school, if you want to go to college, you get in, like you're working your ass off, you get in, I'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out a way to make, you know, pay for college. Cause he'd been paying, I think my tuition for school for like, I think it was like 12 grand a year. Yeah. Which is wild back then. I mean, yeah, just to paint like a picture. So our dad went to the military when he got out. I mean, he was working he worked at Aramark. He worked at every, he would work UBS. like night shifts. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, he was just doing everything he could to make it out. Yeah. 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 Because, because our, our, our stepmom would just stay at home, right? No, Did she? they met, she was the night manager at a, a hotel. Okay. Okay. And at the time dad was the night security manager. So okay. she was like running the hotel and he was running security. Okay. So, um, so, so he said that and like, I kind of just got this feeling. I was like, there's no college fund. Yeah, uh, I mean, there. Yeah, there was. Of, well, of course, it's like it's like I knew that, but then also like the reality, the gravity hit me of if I choose to go to college, it's gonna, it is going to be a financial burden. Yeah, and then the Air Force was kind of like the recruiter was like whatever. They're like, yeah, sure, join whatever. And then I went and talked to the Army recruiter. They're like immediately rolled out that yo, if you qualify for these jobs, military intelligence, which I wound up going into, uh, we'll give you a twenty thousand dollars sign up bonus and college and all this other stuff. So I, what I, what I saw was what my family's not going to have to pay for, what they're not going to have to sacrifice. And then brr, at the bottom, it was selfless dude. family legacy. I just remember having that moment with dad and he was just like, I'll figure it out. But like, fuck, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I decided right then and there, I was like, I don't want that burden. I don't want you to have to take that on. Cause like, I see how stressed out he was, you know, running these other businesses and the coffee house and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't want that for you. I don't want yeah. that for my family. 
So yeah, I joined the army. I swore in my senior year, Christmas break of high school. And uh, yeah, signed up for six years right away. And then um, yeah, shipped out like a month after graduating high school. The rest is history. And then mm. I, you know, kind of the opposite is I, I, I always say the story of like, I was the one that put the end of the tuning like <laughs> legacy. Well, no, like, no, no I, it was I, just each generation. So like, it's like your yeah. kids, my kids, like that's how yeah, it, but it was like, it was like you, you went, dad went, granddad went great Uncle granddad. Jim. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was like every man. And I was, yeah. I was just like, I don't want to do it. Which I don't want to, I don't want to totally do it. Fine. It's like, it's, it's a decision everybody needs to make on their own. Well, to be honest, I, there was a time when you said, when you had the, the, the mindset of like, uh, you, you weren't performing well in school and you were like, I kind of like, I might need to go to the military because I'm not going to get into college. I was scared. I, yeah. I, don't know. I, I, yeah. I had that same thing. I mean, I only applied to one school VCU didn't get in. I was the military to me, not in like a negative way, but the military was going to be my fallback. Like last resort. It was going to yeah, be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go there because I'm not good enough to get in anything else. Not to like down, not that, you know, it, it's a weird kind of concept to say, but like that was a lot of people do that in military. Yeah. And it's fine. Like, and it's most like, people, it changes their life. I mean, it changes their life. That's your last resort. Your last resort is you're going to get a steady paycheck. You're going to have medical insurance, life insurance, a job, yeah, roof no. over your head, like a very challenging job in extreme circumstances. But like, you know, you're going to be fine. To be honest, I, I think the biggest reason I never wanted to go to the military is as, as blatant as I'll put it, like I was a pussy. Like, I, I, I really? was scared. Like, I was scared to go to the military. Like Dude, because you would have, you would have thrived. I just, I just, I'm like, people die in the military. I don't want to die. And that's the thing like, too. I, like, so paint a little bit more context. When this was all going down, I graduated high school 2003. Like we were bombing Iraq. Mm -hmm. We were like, we're looking for Saddam in yeah. the middle of nowhere. But I, yeah, I, like, dude, I, I was a bitch. Like I was like, I don't know if it's unpatriotic or like, I'm not a man, but like, I was like, I don't want to go to the military because I don't want to die. Like I was like, you know, people like I will die for my country. I was like, yeah. I, it's not like I don't want to do. I was, I was like, I'm so afraid. Like I, I was a, a bitch. Like I was, that that's, was why I, I never wanted to go. That's an interesting point. It's just, yeah. it's, it's funny because actually, because I was 17 when I joined, uh, I had to get parental consent. Dad had to sign a form. Mom had to sign a form. I, mom had to sign the form twice because she kept crying on it. <laughs> she was like, I don't want my baby to Your die. tears are lubing the paper incorrectly. Yeah. But, you know, I went in for those reasons. And, like, I, I – look, America's dope. I believe in, you know, fighting for your country. I believe I believe in believing in something more than yourself. Yeah. And I think a lot of people latch on to your, your patriotism as a course of action for that. But I don't, I don't want to paint the picture that I joined because, like, you know, I want to – fight for my country and yeah. I want to like mow people down. You know, I was not that invested into that conflict at the time. I knew what could be asked of me and straight up at that level of like, yo, we're literally at war and yeah. shit's not stopping now. The way that dad painted the picture and especially because how he kind of navigated me and like the, the job, the MOS and stuff that I had, you know, he's like, you know, like this is going to be the best option for you. And like, I just had total utter trust in him. Ultimately it's still my decision, but I was like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. And, and I think me not going to the military is one of, one of the things that kind of is different about you and I, you were in the military. I wasn't. And then there's a lot of, I'm way more good you know, other things. Well, no, you're definitely not. Mm. I've always considered you to be the nicer version of me. <laughs> Whenever I describe you to anyone, I'm like, Ch Chase is like, he's like me. Um, yeah. he's not as animated. Like he's not as like, kind of like, like animated, I guess would be the right word to Depending say. Depending on how many cold brews I have. But I would literally call you, I was like, he's like, a, he's a much nicer version of me. Like he, it may, I, I'm not like, to say that you're not nice. No, but you're way more like selfless than mm. I am. I, there's a lot of tendencies I have where I'm putting myself before whatever in life. Thanks dude. And you're like, you're one of the selfless, most selfless people that I know. And it's like a, a trait that I, I, it's like, I want to do better. And I'm like, I just, I like, sometimes I'm just like, I, I don't do know. Do you look up to me? I, well, sometimes I'm just like, I do. Shit. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know why I am this way. Like, I don't know why I oh, yeah. think of myself first. And it's like, a, it's a bad trait. And I'm like, I always, I, I compare myself to you a lot on, mm. on that level of like selflessness. And you're just like, you're a nicer version of me. Like, there's exactly. no other way to put it. Like, I'm like an asshole. Like, I, I don't know how I've convinced. Look, you've come a long way. I, I, ha I have, I have. You've come a long way, man. But uh, another thing that we have in common, Chase, is our ability to nail some movie quotes, and that is what we're going to talk about today on the Don't Be Sour Game Show. We're going to change up the mood a little bit, and this yeah. is the... Was it shot time? It's shot time. Well, it's, it's, I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Okay? And you have to, if you get them right, mm. I take a shot. 
Right. If you get it wrong, you take a shot. I win, you lose. Correct. But actually, no matter what, you're going to lose. <laughs> because so the, we're playing I win. The first question, Chase, is a lot of times you may look, you may look at my outfit, okay? And go, what the hell did he think? No. Um, you may look at my clothes and say that I have the appearances of riches, but beneath the clothes, I already know. there is a man. And beneath the man, what is, what is beneath a man? You find his nucleus. His nucleus. <laughs> can, I, can, I give, can I give it going? You go ahead, dude. Uh, <laughs> where is your robe? It was stinky. <laughs> what, uh, keep, keep going, keep going. I, I, okay, I, give I, the I people don't, they want. These are my recreational <laughs> clothes. They look expensive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nacho Libre is, is I like of, the way those guys look at you. <laughs> I could quote from start to finish. May didn't believe me that I could do it. She's like, you're an idiot. I was like, I started the, <laughs> I started the whole movie, a quarter of the whole thing. Your wife calls you an idiot? Yeah, that's love, Max. That's love. Yeah, that's love. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Taylor, call me, call me <laughs> stupid. Um, but then I, I had her watch Nacho Libre. She's like, this is the dumbest thing ever. She only laughs when I quote it, the movie she thinks is dumb, which I don't know. Okay, understand. well, speaking of dumb movies, there's one great movie called Dumb and Dumber. And in the, the best movie. in the movie, there's a scene where they pick up the gas man. Mm. Okay. And how did they know I have gas? While they are, you know, on their on their trek across to the uh, you know, John Denver's home country. Where the women swim instinctively like the salmon a capistrana. <laughs> the French are assholes. <laughs> what is the most annoying sound in the world? Chase, I don't think you hit the octave. It's okay, actually, I'm a little tone deaf sometimes. I, I believe it's actually. <laughs> no, you went. You went to. It's more like. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, you lose, Chase. I thought we we're playing. I win. I like to play these games where no matter what, the other dude, person dude is got scared. Gonna lose one. So, Chase, salute. And while we're take, taking this, I want you to kind of, you know, we eventually mm. grew up. And you're doing, Did we? Did you're, we? you're doing some amazing things. And you, you said earlier that you're a podcaster now. Mm. I know, I know I'm, we're, I'm, we're on the pod on the, the maxi poo podcast, but why don't you, you explain what you do for work and let's, let's dive into that side of you. Okay. So here's the podcast. We already, we, you can't cheer. You, you can't, you, you, you can't, can't triple stamp with double stamp, dude. Yes, you can't. Lloyd, 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 Lloyd. Lloyd. Oh, look, Frost. Would <laughs> you look at the buns on that thing? <laughs> he must work out. God, that's ah, is there shit. any shot you can take and not like do that? No, that's all an act, actually. I believe it. Uh, yeah. So, all right. Long story short, I got injured in the military, got medically retired from the military. Okay, wait. But before you expand, just so people, how did you get injured in the military? Because some people might think, like, were, do, were you diving out of a, like a helicopter with like like a you know all you're right. diving in? It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> There was a recall. I didn't know it at the time on this penis pump, and <laughs> and when I was alone in the barracks, and I was yeah, kidding. yeah. It, okay. <laughs> um, all right. You want to? I don't know if I've ever told. I'll I'll get a little deep. All right. You never. There's a little more backstory to like the origin of my my injury. Make it fast. All right. I know we're gonna get to the dad stuff, but when our father passed away, it wrecked my life. Mm -hmm. Emotional black hole. And in the military, when you go, when you have your birthday every year, you got to update, like, it's like life shit, update your insurance, update your information, update your life insurance. At that time I was doing that. And this was the year that dad passed away. They upped the life insurance policy to $400,000. I was like, dope, cool. So if I pass away, if I die in service, my family's going to get 400 K that stuck with me. And I wound up actively pursuing deployments because to try to die. I didn't care if I lived anymore. What? Yeah. I was never, I always say I was never suicidal, but I literally just like, I was in such pain and I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I just didn't care if I lived or died anymore. I was like, I'm not going to do anything to myself, but if I go overseas, if I'm fighting, if I'm whatever, if I'm in harm's way and my life ends, I'm fine with that. Especially because I knew that my family was going to be financially taken care of. So because of that, but on, on your mission to be super humble, you, what happened? <laughs> I had a boo-boo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it just didn't work out. You know, 
the nature of my work, I was worked in military intelligence. I was a Russian intelligence specialist and a linguist. And I, at that point, I mean, like we were in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I was volunteering my intelligence specialty uh, over there. And it was looking promising for one mission. And before you get deployed, you have to go through a series of like war game trainings, basically. And I was on the path, the very first series of war games. I was only on the field for like a couple of days, uh, leading an ambush. I was leading my team against, we call it the op for the opposing force, leading an ambush against the fake enemy. I play a lot of Call of Duty. I, I know, okay, I know so all the terminology. I was leading the ambush against the op four. Okay. In that ambush, just like in the pursuit of jumping over this berm, I'm in full body armor with my weapon, just like, just everything went wrong. I wound up tearing my hamstring, suffered trauma to my L4, L5 vertebrae, my back, just had a lot of trauma that hit me right in my- Like there was like a, a stick sticking out of the ground, you tripped over it? Like how did you- Like, like how a did you twig, like a twig, you know, the, you know, the recall thing I was talking about earlier. Okay. Uh, no, so like I literally, so we, I'm in the prone position, I'm laying down, the enemy's coming through the lane, I jump up, I pop up, I call, lead the assault, and then like we jump over the berm and just like, just that- What's a berm? Like, like, like a little baby hill. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you just call it that? I thought you said we play Call of Duty. There's no berms in Call of Duty. Back in now, we have berms coming out of our wazoo. Um, so I was leading the assault and just, I just got up in the wrong way, too fast, the wrong direction. Like my body armor, my pack rucksack, everything just kind of like shifted. Your body was like, nope. It was just like, <laughs> no. So I tore my left hamstring. My L4, L4 and L5 vertebrae wound up having like a lot of like trauma and just like torsion. Uh, and that ultimately led to severe damage in my hips, just like overcompensation and rehabilitation issues. And I re-injured myself. I, I have overcompensation issues as well. Well, that's a personality trait. Small penis. So you had to get surgery? So ultimately wound up having to have both my hips completely reconstructed, which at that point they're like, you're not deployable and like you're too broken to even be a soldier anymore. So I got medically kicked out. Did they put ant anti antim antimanum? Anti Aluminium? Ant adamantium. What does Wolverine have? Ant ant and the fact that you even have to ask that. I'm what is it? Ant ant adamantium. Animant adamantium. An enemy. An 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 enemy. An enemy. Okay. So and your hips. So how does that translate to So being so my last like 15 months in the military, I was a patient. I was just like bedridden. I was in surgery. I was in rehab. I had no job. I had no purpose. Uh, and then ultimately the like, after I learned how to walk again, they're like, we're, you're useless to us. So they kicked me out. Uh, that was the catalyst for me wanting to like, not accept that and wanted to really learn the human body. Would that be called honorably discharged? I was honorably discharged, okay. but the nature of my injuries and the rating that they gave me was at a high enough level. It wasn't just, it was honorable discharge, medical discharge, medical retirement. Okay. So basically instead of having to serve 20 years, I got out at six after the injuries and I was medically retired. So I got like retiree benefits. And okay. Um, so that was the catalyst for me wanting to learn the human body uh, because, you know, I left, like I was still on a cane. You, you were trying to find the G spot too. I still haven't found it. I'll show you later. That's weird. Why did I say that? <laughs> what? 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 No, no, no. <laughs> Cut that out. Cut that out. Dude. Abort, Just abort, abort. Cut that clip, Oz. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so I was really, really interested in the human body. I decided to study it because I was still rehabilitating myself. Okay. And then, so I enrolled at VCU, uh, moved back to Richmond, Virginia, went to school there, studied exercise science, realized I actually really liked this. Um, then wound up going to grad school, worked in health and wellness and clinical medicine, concierge medicine. And like, I began to really soak everything up. I was like reading, I was going to conferences. And then somebody one day was like, you know, hey, you should check out this podcast. You're into health, right? I think you'd like this show. Like most people back in 2015 was like, what the hell is a podcast? So it's 2015, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I found the show, shout out Model Health Show, uh, Sean Stevenson, who's now a homie. And uh, I just was learning. I was like, this is incredible. I'm literally going to my job, going to see my clients, my patients with the most up-to-date, amazing information. And I was better at my job because of it. And so then I thought, well, shit, if I'm listening and learning all this knowledge, what if I was the one doing it? Um, and so I decided to start a podcast. I, li I like to think that you, similar, like, okay, so in the fitness space, I, I still is, I still consider myself a fitness influencer, but like, you know, literally 5% of my YouTube yeah. videos now have like fitness content. So it's kind of weird, but I still consider myself- You're barely that. fitting this in. <laughs> but I've, I've evolved, dude. 
But I, I like to think of like, I, I wasn't the first to get in the fitness wave, but I was in the early stages. And that's how you were with podcasts. Like you, you I started YouTubing before it was cool to YouTube. I'm like the yeah, hipster yeah, of YouTube. Yeah. And you started podcasting before it was cool to podcast. It was a thing. I mean, podcasting has technically been around, I think, I think technically for like 16 years. Right, right, right. RSS but like, movie, but you like, know, now, like, for example, like now it is very common for everyone to everyone have a podcast. and their brother has a podcast. Yeah, literally. That, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But you, you, you've you been doing it since what year? I technically started in 2016. Uh, so when I decided to do it, I reached out our Uncle Mitch, uh, who has like been in radio his life. Right. I was like, yo, I'm thinking about doing this. Like, how do I do it? Recording, editing, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of dicked around for about like four months trying to figure stuff out. And then once I really got serious, I was nailing down like the format. Do I want to talk? Do I want to do interview? Uh, and then I began to just like reach because at that point, like you had become kind of solidified and, you know, in YouTube and anybody else in the time who was doing social media, doing fitness, social media, health, fitness, social media, like legitimately, um, you know, it was a small group. Yeah. And so like you were one of those people. And so thanks to you and like just us interacting with people on the Internet, we, we kind of like knew a lot of people and, and or at least people that were like talking about it, you know, and like making content. And so I was like, well, shit, okay, cool. Here's a lot of a lot of people that I think would be down to talk about it and they're used to creating content. If that, I don't even know if content was like a word back then, um, but I would like to start there. I wanna do the interview style and I'm gonna go health, fitness, nutrition. Yeah. And Christian, uh, actually it's, yo, bro, six years ago, literally to the like day or 48 hours, he was in town visiting you for your birthday Right after uh, I just got married, you had just gotten your first place after we lived together. And the, I was like, yo, Christian, you want to be my first guest? So so Christian Guzman was your first The very first guest. interview. He was also mine. Yeah, yeah. And so he was like, yeah, yeah, of course. What's a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'll do it. Yeah. What, what is it's it? Like, it's yeah. like a Q&A, uh, but I asked yeah, yeah. you the questions and then we just talked for like an hour. Like, yeah. 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 And so um, I started there and just haven't looked back since. Um, and I was doing it for the whole first year while I was a health coach and wound up, I wound up getting promoted in that company. And um, like my job took me to a lot of places, but I really f fell in love with podcasting because it's like just continuous education. I'm yeah. like, I would be reading these books, talking to these people, watching these videos, going to these places, doing these things anyways. And then I just kind of figured out like, all right, if I want to make this a thing, I need to fully commit. I need to kind of, you know, piss or get off the pot. You know, I, I've come to learn with my life, everything that I think is stupid, I end up liking later in life. Like for example, when I was younger, girls, mm -hmm. dumb, working out, dumb, right? I used to, my roommates, I tell them stupid. You used to make fun of everybody for going to the gym. Like, why would I do that? I can just stay here and drink Mountain Dew and eat candy and play Call of Duty. That's correct. Yeah. Like that's a direct quote, Max Tuning circa 2000, 2008, like 2009, yeah. eight to 13. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's accurate. And I also thought, the podcast thing was dumb. Like, not that, like, I think you're dumb for doing podcasts. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, that's so dumb. Like, I, it's like, YouTube videos are cool. Yeah. Why would anyone want to listen to someone talk yeah, for like yeah, an yeah. hour? Like, I was like, yeah. I couldn't wrap my head around it. And, you know, here we are. I've taken a page out of your book and, you know, started this. I still like to call it a show because I... I call it a show. I yeah. don't, not that I, I don't, I, I like people who consume the content, or whatever, but in my mind, I'm like, watch it on YouTube. Like, this is something you'll watch. You need to, well, that's the, what you come You need from. the expressions. Like, yeah, you need yeah. the emotions, like, to see the people. I like the, like, I don't, I like, I don't want people to, don't, I literally just put it on Spotify and them because I'm like, okay, I probably should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In, in a perfect world, it would just be a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't even want it. Like, you need to watch this. Well, I told you when you were talking to me about doing it, that was kind of like your approach. And I was like, cool, but do it as a podcast, yeah. like get it up, but like make it an RSS feed, do all these things just because way, the way the content is going, especially the podcasting world, it's just like, I, I, I view it personally as like, if you're a content creator and especially if you're like making a business out of it in any way, shape or form, it's like, you know, bro, you need a YouTube, bro, you need a uh, yeah. Instagram, bro, yeah. you need a podcast. Uh, so, so what is, what is your podcast about? Because I liked it. Another, how I said that you're like the nicer, kind of less animated, <laughs> uglier version of me. Mm -hmm. Another big difference is that you, I would call you a very deep individual. Like, mm -hmm. a, I, I don't know if spiritual is the word. I have become. Y you have. Year four, LA Chase has become Shaman Chase. Yeah, Chase yeah. wears like a talisman and shit. 
Goes to Tulum once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, like when you go this to Tulum and buy, buy an outfit and you like wear it when you're in Tulum, yeah. Chase, where is that like on a Wednesday in LA? Yeah. So I, I would consider you like a very deep, deep thinker. Like I, 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 so like when I get on the podcast, I, I don't know if it's me as a person, personality trait of like, I'm, I just keep things like light, lighthearted. I, I, I dive deep on certain topics. Like but, laughing at yourself, farting in the bathtub. <laughs> dumbest motherfucker ever walked the planet. What does that mean for? I don't know that one. What? What is that one? Tropic Thunder. Oh, I need to rewatch that. Uh, can I say, you can't say the R word, but like, never go full. <laughs> never go full. That's the whole lot, the whole quote. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, I know. I, okay, I, 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 need to, I need to rewatch it. Amateur hour over here. <laughs> I'm a dude disguised as a dude playing another dude. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, you're very deep, Chase. And that's just because my balls you, drop more than yours. <laughs> So you, you like, whenever I try to describe like your podcast to someone else, my description of it before you mm -hmm. kind of describe what yours is, is I'm like, Chase is more of a, like, what is your purpose on li in life? Mm -hmm. What is your why? I know it's a big question you ask. Like, mm -hmm. what is the reasoning behind your, your actions where mm -hmm. I'm just, I would call myself surface level entertainment where Chase is like, I'm going to dive, dive into the, I know I'm entertaining, dude. I'm so, I'm the funniest. Movie. I will go on record, hands down, and say you are the funniest. Actually, hold on. Wait, you, I'm gonna use this as a clip. Say okay. it, dude. You are the funniest human being I've ever met in my entire life. I know, me too. I think yeah. I'm the funniest guy I've ever yeah. met. You do come neck and neck with another friend we have, a, a friend of May's, uh, who Netta. I don't think you've met her. Uh, in terms of just like wit and just like wait a second, that's actually the most hilarious thing I've ever heard. You know what's uh, before, okay? I, I want to dive into the podcast yeah, thing yeah, about, yeah. about your podcast, but a little little side tangent. Um, What's interesting is I'm like a leech, Chase. I'm like a leech mm. in life. You know, like a leech like needs other people to like li to live, right? right yeah, yeah. That's me. Like I'm only funny. <laughs> I need other people to be funny because I need you to say some shit. You're like a comedy succubus. No, no, th like uh, that's why I've had a lot of times people are like, oh, like you should like stand up. I was like, no, 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 no. Mm. That's why I, I don't succeed on like TikTok with my humor because you have to know me because my, yeah, yeah, my yeah. humor comes from someone saying something and then as soon as they finish saying something, my <laughs> Rolodex, super big, powerful brain. Yeah, I'm like, like, yeah. like, and it's crazy because I'm like, the, the the jokes that I'm gonna say, I had no idea I was gonna say them until you said this thing. So yeah, you're not like sitting on a stockpile of jokes. It's no, just like, I, I, got it. I don't have like, I can't tell jokes. Yeah. Like, it's not like, be funny, clown, dance, monkey. Like, I just, I just, I, I need other people to say stuff from then me to yeah. say dumb replies. But- I appreciate that. I do think I'm the funniest person I've ever met. Yeah, it's okay. official. But you're very, very deep. So explain kind of like what your podcast show, because it's called Everford Radio. Everford Radio. Which, yeah, I don't know if we're going to have, I say I need pot, part twos with everyone, but one segment I wanted to go into, because like, we get a lot of questions about the crossover between Everford Apparel, are yeah. they the same company? I don't know if we're going to have time today, but same, same, Let's but different. It. Let's give Rogan a run for his money, you know? Six hour podcast. Four and a half hours. Ooh, the longest running one's 12 hours. What? Yeah. Mine's like two, but okay, anyway, anyway. Explain what your podcast is. Exp explain what Everford Radio right. is, what it's about, why you make it, who are your, because your guests, mm. like I'm going for, I'm trying to get like Dane cooking shit on here where, where you're like talking to people of like, I've never heard of in my life. And, but like, I feel like you, you have more purposeful people, <laughs> it, not to bash any of my people, but I don't know. Like you just, every former guest of yours would be like, yo, fuck this guy. Like, like, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking like down on like kind of my, my stuff that I do, but like, you're just, everybody's got their own path. You, you're just like, your stuff's deep. Like you go deep. You're like, what, like, what is your, why, why are you on this earth? For me, I'm like, I don't fucking know. I'm just like making YouTube videos and stuff. Make candy. All right. Yeah. All right, all right. I'm, I'm talking too much. People can yell at me in the comments. Well, I'll tell you, I give you a lot of credit for, for a lot of things. You inspire me, you motivate me for a lot of things, just like, especially in the entrepreneurial path, but just creativity. And like, you are, I think, besides mildly funny. Uh, Hype me up, Chase, come on. You are one of the most fearless people I've ever met. Except the army, I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, shit, there's actual danger involved, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, seeing you, like quite, li after I, I moved back, and like, especially once we, we lived together for a year, um, like just seeing you again, being with you again in that level and like seeing you and watching you work and like just how you tick and like how you create things was like super curious to me. But like the bravery you My friends had, call me whiskers. Cause I'm curious like a cat. <laughs> hey, Norm, what's your favorite plant? <laughs> Mine's the sun. <laughs> I can stare at it for hours. It's, 
It's actually a star. Well, star planet. When that thing blows up, we're all going to be dead. <laughs> Tune in next week. We get renowned scientist Albert Einstein. Just found out he's dead. <laughs> we're going to get him anyway. <laughs> all right, dude, all right, keep going. If you're on Desert Highland and you're a hot dog, would you eat yourself? I know I would. <laughs> okay, all right. Here you go. Wow, we're actual idiots. Yeah. Um, so I say all that, give you props. It's your birthday. I can be nice to you once. Uh, but also just be like, when you presented Ever Forward to the world, that was at a time in my life where just talking about anything with our father, saying those words brought me immense, immense pain and anxiety and like sent me back down a yeah. negative hole. And so when I saw you presented to the world and like people received it, not only as just like cool logo, cool brand, cool name, but like how you did it, you presented the story in a way that I was unable to do at the time. Like I could never go on, like I couldn't even talk to people in real life, much less on the internet about like, here's what happened in my life. Yeah about that it impacted me in a way and then i saw like the feedback that people were having of like wow like you're courageous and brave and like that's so meaningful so i'm more implied you know more inclined to like to follow you to buy from you to like support you and like it also instilled in them a concept of being brave and courageous and like turning adversity into an advantage and making the obstacle before you the way and so that really, really stuck with me. And so when I got this concept later on, you know, like another like year or so later of like, I want to do a podcast, this, the second I go, I want to start a podcast, a second later I go, it's ever forward radio. Yeah, yeah. Like there's no question. Um, and it was because I was like, this is an opportunity for me to not only do something that I want to pursue, but like you, I'm, I don't know if this was intentional, I don't know, but like, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of running and my life. I hate cardio. Dude, get small, bro. As like good as it was then, like I was fully rehabilitated. I was yeah. the strongest I'd ever been. I was the leanest I'd ever been. You know, I just met then my now wife and like I was getting promoted and like on the outside, everything was going great. But like on the inside, like I was dying. Yeah. And I was running away from that pain and I wasn't facing it. I wasn't facing any of that. And so I was like, here's my opportunity whether that was intentional with you or not, to actually like turn and face and run towards it. So if I choose to do something on a weekly basis that is based off, the whole name and premise is based off the most agonizing dark period of my life, like it has to help me. Like I, I'm choosing to believe that this is gonna serve me and this is gonna help me. So it's gonna be Ever Forward Radio. And it didn't start right away, but then like pretty quickly afterwards, like I wound up realizing, kind of bringing back to like, I wanna know what, what makes you tick? Like, how do you live a life ever for this theme that our father had had instilled in us and this mantra that we picked up? Um, and like, you felt so compelled to create a brand out of like, I was like, shit, I want to do the same. I yeah. want that for me. And I hope that it is going to be passed on in that light as well to one person or, you know, now pushing 3 million that listens to Everford radio. Um, and so I say all that because like, I did it out of necessity for my life, yeah, for my mental health, it was. I think it'd be like an, it's a, it's a, it was an outlet for you to. Oh my god, yeah, yeah kind of, yeah. And it, still today, like I am in such a better place with that trauma and with that loss. Like I am like literally in the most. I didn't even know that I could get to this place in my yeah. life and my mental health. Um, but like when I still talk to guests every day, I shoot my show two days a week now. Like every guest on the show, when they tell me, when they answer that question, like it keeps nurturing me. It keeps helping me what's the, heal. What's the question? What does ever forward mean to you? How do you live a life ever forward? And that comes at the end of the conversation after we run through their story and after I've had an opportunity to kind of share. So it's a, it's this really cool way for like your world to melt into mine, your expertise to come under like my theme to like, tell me your story, tell me your meaning, but through my lens, it's a unique way for them to kind of put themselves in my shoes and for me to learn really, really specifically from them. Yeah. Um, so it was a no brainer. Like it, I'm going to do a podcast. It's going to be called Everford radio. It was back then it was a lot more fitness and nutrition oriented because that was my job. Yeah. Um, but for the last like three years, it's really expanded because I've realized as I have grown and evolved in the things that support me and my wellness and my relationships and just my happiness, uh, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well being, like that, that goes in a lot of different directions, like living a life ever forward 
it's not just like, how do you get a PR? Like, how do you put on 20 pounds of mass? You know, like, how do you get the girl or get the promotion? It's like, how do you, how do you get out of bed every day? Like, how have you overcome some of the things that have happened in your life? And you chose to not let that keep you in bed. You chose to not let that keep you in the wheelchair, you know, whatever, like you chose to not accept that you chose to make the obstacle before you the way. And to me, that's living a life ever forward. And so it's become a way for me to kind of really continue on dad's legacy in a way, uh, and to grow, I say the family brand, the yeah. meaning, you know, ever forward. Um, and just like as a cool, different extension of that meaning and that mantra. Yeah. And I, I don't know, man, I, we're, we're different. We're the same and we're different in a lot of ways because, you know, I, I think I use, I, I would say a, a, a common theme that people probably, maybe people who dislike me on some sort of level. Who? I'll kill them. I know. Motherfuckers. Probably can't, probably, probably, probably max out a deadlift 450, bro. <laughs> anyway, I use humor yeah. as a defense mechanism. Um, in my life, like whether it be anyone talking down on me, you know, whatever, I just look as like, I turn, I I make everything a joke. And to some people that comes off insincere, maybe um, immature, because they're like, everything is a joke to you. Everything is that like, give me some depth. Yeah. You can't be deep. And like, for me, like I, I have a deeper side. I just Mm -hmm. choose to not really, I, I, I like, it's not like, it's more reserved. Yeah, it's, it's like I, I don't want to. It's not like I'm like a hiding or like it's like a, afraid. It's more of like I don't, I don't want that to be like I, I want to be funny. Like I want people to laugh. I you've want people. always been that way. This is not something new for you. Like ever yeah. since I can remember, you've always been the comedic center. Yeah, and I don't know if it's like you know g- good or bad, but like for example, when you that's the difference between you know kind of like you know me and you, especially in like the podcast space, is like you ask like re- very deep and meaningful questions. And I don't know why myself (laughs) as a person, like I just, I can't really do that. Like I can't do what you do because I, I just, I'm like, everything needs to have a punchline. Everything needs to be funny. Everything needs to be lighthearted. Like, you know, when you were like talking about like, you know, like how do you get out of bed in the morning? The first thing that came into my fucking mind chase is like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, my I, alarm I, I, don't know, I, I look at my phone and I, like, I stand up, but I'm like, but in my head, I'm like, I'm like, why is that the thing? Like, why can't I be serious? Yeah. And, and, and like, like you're talking about a very serious thing. And why does my fucking brain immediately go to some immature, stupid, like comment? I, I don't know. Well, here's the thing. I, <laughs> I personally think we seek out the things in life that a, we're like naturally most aligned with, but also be like, we really crave the most. Yeah. And so for me, I mean, especially going back to when, when I really kind of had that pivot in like 2019-ish to go from Everford Radio, I mean, is a fitness and nutrition show because that's when I, I really hung up being health coach hat, uh, health coach Chase. And I, like, I dumped all of myself into Everford Radio. Like I am podcast Chase. Yeah. Um, that's when I kind of realized that like, I don't have to compartmentalize my life as much. And I also- was, I like that word. I, I want to I use that more in my life. I, I, I no compartmentalize compartmentalize. I yeah. I've heard people use that. And I really like that. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a, no, that wasn't even a joke. That's serious. I, it's I, a, I, did you just get real? Yeah. No. Mm. It's, but it's like, but it's so necessary. And I think this is like a struggle that I had. And I only know this now looking back, um, like hanging up health coach chase, hanging up military chase, hanging up whatever version. I mean, you have gone through so many versions of yourself. There is so much identity locked into these versions of ourselves, whether it's just like, oh, that's a job that I had, or this is a thing that I did, or a content that I created. There's an identity that we have associated to that. And when we feel or want to, or sometimes are forced to transition out of that, there's a mourning process that has to happen because we're not just leaving behind a content or a category or a job or relationship. We're leaving behind a version of ourself. And so it's like that version of ourself needs to be mourned. We need to recognize that's who I was. That's what served me to get to this point. And I'm not not that person anymore, but I am now taking only certain things of that version of myself to move into the next version of myself. And that's the choice that I had to make. And this is all kind of like the personal work 
and personal development and mindset work that I, I, I love and that I'm constantly after because I'm like, bro, the human potential is incredible. I look at like, I will, I will flat out toot my horn right now. Like I literally went from being told I'm a like useless soldier. Like you're probably gonna struggle walking for many, many, many years of your life. Like give up exercise. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. And then I went on to like study the human body and apply it and like do it as a career. I look at dad who like went through a similar injury and like failure after failure with job and job and just like family and falling apart. Like he never gave up. He ne he chose to never accept the cards that were dealt. Yeah. Because like, and I think if we make that choice and this is the whole concept of like, if you're living a life ever forward, everything you do is a choice. And every choice you make, like we we're saying earlier, has a consequence. We have the power to make a different choice. But in doing so, like I said, we're, we're gonna be shedding a former version of ourselves. We're gonna be losing or letting go of that identity and embarking on a new one. Whether we know what that new one is or not, we're stepping into a new identity and a new category and a new creation and new everything. And so when I hung up health coach Chase, it opened up my eyes to like what I'm really sitting on. Like yeah. what I what like what I have in terms of just my ability. Like I chose to leave my job and step into the unknown and do this thing, but more or less like when I hung that up, I was like, I don't have to be that version of myself. It's still a big part of me. I mean, we crushed a workout today and like, yeah. I'm never not going to do that. But like that opened up my eyes to the possibility of what could be. Yeah. yeah it, it's bro. First of all, you're so good at fucking talking. Like, <laughs> like, like I do this for a living. I know, but, but, like, but like, like the stuff you say, I'm like, that. it's just like, I can't, I couldn't even begin to <laughs> <laughs> Say, Wait, maybe if you read one of the books I got you. I don't like reading books, That's dude. True. But like, dude, like you're so talented at mom's calling us. <laughs> mom, my, my, mom my, my mom, my mom's calling us. I wish I, if I had my phone, I'd put her on the <laughs> podcast. She's actually coming on in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But you're so talented at getting across kind of like a a thought where mm. it may be just who I am as a person and like the immaturity level. But like, I can't do that. Like, I can't. It's every not a, it's everything. Not it's I want everyone to like go back and listen to like the last like three, four minutes of this podcast and what you just said, I never in a million years could like word what mm. you just said as like, I'm like, I, I understand what you're saying, but like I couldn't word mm. that, those phrases together. I would say some stupid fucking joke and like say some dumb shit. But see, ultimately we would be saying the same thing, but you would say it in your way and I would say it in mine. And in your head, your interpretation would land on the same meaning as what I said. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. It's, it's interesting seeing the kind of different sides, uh, sides, sides of us. And, you know, you with your podcast, which has been, you know, amazing to see you grow and you do this full time. So, I mean, obviously we have, we haven't gotten to the very end of this show yet. Um, but I hope everyone that is, is listening, make sure you go check out Everford radio. Everything's going to be linked down below Thank because you. it's such a, uh, you've been on like, like four times. Yeah. Now, and yeah. it's just such a different type of podcast that like, I think if you're tr looking for like I feel like your show and your like people listen to you is like not necessarily not everyone like this, but like if you were like <laughs> lost in life, like oh, if wow. you were like, I, I don't know like what mm. to do. I'm pulled different ways. I don't know what my purpose is. Like you're the person, like you're the shining light, bro. Damn, dude. Like the, the really like Thank mine. You. I'm like, I just filmed stupid fucking videos, bro. Like, but we need comedy. We need but like, in, in my mind, I, I look at this, the content that I put out mm. and I look at the content that you put out and it's almost unfair <laughs> of the, of the views and stuff that I get because I'm like, my videos are, are about nothing. Bro. Oh, I, oh damn it. Wow. Like, like, like and, and, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, you. yours have like purpose. Mm. Like you, and I like, I, that's why I'm saying it's like unfair. Mm. Like, that like I, like why I don't know why my videos about me doing fucking nothing do that and I'm like dude, like Chase is way smarter than me and like is giving <laughs> actual like r like help to people and I guess it's just like a different delivery method but 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 I, I whenever I say that I sometimes look back at my service I'm like I deliver this in this in a different way but sometimes I look back at it I like if I was to you know, float out of my body, look at it, be like, no, it doesn't, Max. <laughs> your videos are not, there's no deeper meaning in your videos. You suck. I don't know, man. It, it, it's it's really interesting. And, and something that I think has helped you on your deeper journey in life and which has really you know, helped in, in your podcast and the guests you, and you have and the people, like what you talk about 
is that you're very open about uh, the psychedelic enhancements. You want to call it Chase does drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Chase yeah. lives in an area that, 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 that it, but you do like legally dosed. Mm-hmm. So Chase, I want to. And technically, co- technically still some federally illegal substances. <laughs> yeah. I, I am an open book. I, okay. Well, well, yeah. well we're not going to talk about the, the federally yeah. illegal, but okay. like, so I want to just briefly, I want to talk about, um, Chase goes to these these places and they, he does prescribed, mm. clinically dosed, uh, medically delivered, mm. professionally delivered mm. um, ketamine trips. Ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And I, I those have helped on your, everything that you do, you would associate these kind of like ketamine trips, mm. like, with, like to how, how you've kind of like developed as a person, right? Oh yeah, I mean, Ketamine assisted psychotherapy has been a part of my wellness practice now for October will be a year. Um, it has contributed to the most, some of the most significant emotional healing, mental health healing, personal growth. Like I, I didn't even, it's like when people are hurting or you're suffering in any way, any way, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever, you experience something that shows you a level of hope that you didn't even fathom was possible it's like ineffable, these experiences. Um, and it has transformed my life and because of it and the work associated, I, quick disclaimer, I, I don't, I personally don't believe that any type of experience, any type of altered consciousness state, whether that's breath work, ketamine, whatever, yeah. uh, is an end all be all. I never wanna paint that picture. It is an incredible and powerful tool when in the right circumstances and in the right mindset and in, in the right prep work to allow a container of healing to happen in a way that is radically different than anything else you've ever experienced. God, can you do y'all hear like how he just like broke down that sentence? It's like, I can't, my, vo- <laughs> my vernacular vocabulary could not even begin you got vernacular? to extrapolate what this man just said. It's preposterous. It's preposterous. Okay, so the, the, these trips, and you do you do these like microdoses of mushrooms. You're very yeah. like uh, today is a microdose day for me. You're on drugs right now. I'm on psilocybin. You're Micro- on what? Psilocybin. So, so explain what that is. Like you know, like what, what psilocybin is a mushroom. It's a it's a strain. One of like we know a couple hundred strains of psilocybin right now in the fungi kingdom, mushrooms. But you know, you got portobello mushrooms. You got trumpet mushrooms, lion's mane, cordyceps. And then like the, one, the ones like Mario takes to like get really big yeah, and, and then stuff. you get toad, exactly. Okay, yeah. so I wanna, I wanna kind of break it down. So first of all, why did you start experimenting with these mushrooms? Mm. You know, I wish I really had a, a like super cool story about it, but it was literally an experience in the middle of COVID where I was, I straight up, I was in a party in the hills of Los Angeles. It's so LA, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, so, you're so fucking cool. The hills of us. Um, yeah, I, I can't be a singer. And I walked into this party and it was with- And they were like, who the fuck are you? Get out. <laughs> you weren't invited. <laughs> this is who I am. See, I'm like, why, why did I say that? Why did I interrupt the story? I what I know. should say is I snuck into a party. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, May was invited to a party. I was allowed to go with her. <laughs> this person okay. who I trust and know very well was just like, take this. It ain't gonna, don't worry, you won't die. And were, were, I, you, were you hesitant or you just like, fuck it? Well, I, I, he opened up his hand and I looked at it and my entire life, I was 35 at this point, 34, 35, going on 35, whatever. And my entire life, so much of our backstory we talked about of growing up in a very rule focused, religious, conservative household. I was in the military for many years, so like can't do shit. I live my life by rules. Yes, no, up, down, right, wrong. Like I'm that guy who was standing on the sidewalk, even if there was not a car in sight, waiting for the light to turn white to cross the street. Bro, you are a loser. <laughs> You're a, you yeah. are a nerd and yeah. I, I would have beaten you up in high school. I've never gotten in a yeah. fight, I'm just kidding. That was me, but when it was presented to me, I mean, you know, call it life, call it experience, call it where we were in the world with COVID and all these like whatever. I was just like, I was so confused and I had so many questions and I was becoming so more curious as to like, what's really going on? Yeah. Like, 
is this right? Is this wrong? Is this up? Is this down? Matrix and, mode. Yeah, seriously. And uh, it seemed like eternity when he goes, take this. It seemed like literally I was standing there for an hour, like, uh, he's, but it was a snap decision. I go, I go, fuck it. I grabbed it, put it in my pill. And then he goes, oh, dag, I didn't mean for you to <laughs> wait, eat the you, whole bag. Wait, 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 you took which one? Which pill? <laughs> um, it was MDMA. That was the Eminem reference, by the way. Okay, go. Spaghetti, spaghetti. <laughs> it was MDMA. And uh, I thought we were talking about mushrooms. And it all starts. It all starts with that. It gets there. MDMA is Molly. It is. It was That's M like that song. Molly, 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 Molly. Something like that, right? I don't know. I'm looking for Molly, days. Molly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I thought they were just finding, trying to find this girl. Yo, she's been MIA for a minute. Okay. Hey, can we get a search party? Okay, well, this, this story's go, going differently, I think. Well, it's because you keep interrupting me. Oh, I have a problem. It's we have a comedic relief. It's funny. Okay. So, anyway, so I took the MDMA, and that night I had this just, it's MDMA is called an entheogen, a heart opener. Uh, it just increases a lot of dopamine, serotonin. So, you're literally flooded with love. And you like literally just feel, you feel just connected in a way that, you're not, unless you're just, you know, like a mother breastfeeding or, you know, like seeing your child Which you the can't first be. time. I've tried. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm not allowed anywhere near a uh, playground. Anyway, that's a dumb joke. Uh, and so I had this experience. I, I realized something in my marriage that I thought was a problem with her, but it made me realize how it was actually a me problem. Yeah. And it was like, man, I hardly ever argue. Like we have a great relationship and like little dumb shit here and there, but like there was no, we have no problems. And there was just one thing that kept popping up that I thought was a her thing. And I was like, wow, no, like that's me. Like I have a problem with this. And like the way that I show up because I have a problem with it causes problems in my marriage, causes us to fight. And I like that night, I just like, I started crying to her and I apologized. Like, I'm so sorry. Like I never viewed it from this perspective. And from that moment on, I was like, oh shit. So like, hold up. All these things that I thought were wrong, drugs, uh, that I believed like, if I look at a marijuana plant, I'm gonna burn in hell. I'm gonna become homeless. I'm gonna lose my job. That doesn't I'm, happen. I'm gonna, I mean, I haven't become homeless yet despite the LA rent prices. Um, but I was like, huh. So that got me curious about a lot of other stuff. You know, me being, you know, my health and wellness background, I began to study everything. I looked at clinical evidence. I began to talk to a lot of people. I began to like look at the research because again, like some of this stuff is sketch, you know? But I just want to say this podcast does not condone or endorse the use of illegal drugs mm -mm. or anything like that. Keep going. No. So I began to research. I began to get very curious. I talked to a lot of people and I decided that, you know, I wanted to try other stuff. I wanted to try psilocybin. So I decided then on my 30- that's, that's mushrooms. Mushrooms. Okay. Magic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms, whatever you want to call it. Uh, psilocybin is just a strain of fungi. And um, I decided that I wanted to try it. So I did on my 35th birthday. And again, experienced nothing but just love. And I was like, hold up. So the first time I tried something that everybody told me was bad or was going to like ruin my life, I solved a problem in my marriage that has not come up again. The second time that I tried them, I experienced nothing but love for everybody around me and made everything better um, and zero side effects, whatever. Again, totally personal in my experience. Yeah. Um, I was like, again, very curious. So I began to microdose, I began to research and find- Microdose is just literally very small very, doses. Very, very small. So like, you know, if you're gonna go on, let's say a, a psilocybin psychedelic trip, you're gonna trip, right? For the average person, you probably need at least two grams, maybe two to three. That's a pretty decent trip. Um, and so like a, a microdose is like, for me, I do like 0. Um, 0.165, like okay. so 165 milligrams. Um, so I began to like really go down that rabbit hole and I would experiment with microdose, large doses. Um, but then around that time, um, ketamine had become, is kind of rising to the top. And it was really getting introduced into mainstream healthcare because it's federally legal. Like, have you ever been under anesthesia? Yes. You've been on ketamine. Oh my God, I've yeah. been on drugs. Sorry, mom. Okay. We do drugs. Uh, but basically, yeah, so ketamine is a federally legal, super. It's a horse tranquilizer. Well, I mean, in high dose, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's a horse tranquilizer, right? Yeah, That's they use it to tranquilize horses in very large doses. Okay. If you've been under anesthesia, odds are you've been under ketamine. The okay. vast majority of people under anesthesia, you've had ketamine. 
So they just do smaller doses because what they realize in clinical trials, um, I don't know, maybe like a, a couple of decades ago, they were getting reports back of people like, oh yeah, like I went in for surgery and had this procedure and like, yeah, my, my knee is better, my pain is better, but also like I'm not depressed. Also my mental health is great. Also I'm, I'm going outside again. And they're like, what's going on here? And they traced it back to ketamine. And so what they began to do was test it out with ketamine, smaller doses, and it's federally legal. So they would administer it in a clinic under medical supervision. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all around this time, it was becoming popularized and uh, you know, ketamine clinics were popping up. And uh, May, bring it full circle here. Your wife. My wife had just graduated from USC. She's a fully new certified licensed family nurse practitioner looking for her first new job as an FNP. This clinic, shout out Field Trip Health, posted a job opening in LA. They needed a new provider. And so she applied, she got it. And then when I decided to try ketamine therapy, it was with her. So I went into her clinic. She's so like- So now your wife- She's per, shooting me up. Your wife gives you these ketamine trips, which is, it's like you go and you do these prescribed like ther it, therapy trips, right? Yes, yeah, so you go in and it's, it's, it's called assisted psychotherapy because you go in, it's like you would go to your therapist or if you have a therapist or if you choose to pursue therapy. Uh, I would met with a therapist. I would kind of, my specific intention was going in. This was my, excuse me, 36. I was coming up on 36 last year. And to kind of bring it full circle with dad, like, I had, had such great experiences and I had grown so much in my healing with him and things like MDMA, things like breath work, even just changing my breathing pattern, um, things like psilocybin allowed me to view my life and my problems and my successes and just the self so objectively in a way that I've never experienced. It's like, imagine if I, imagine anyone who is taught, is thought or told, hey, think about the worst thing that ever happened to your life. When you do that, human nature, our amygdala kicks in. Like you don't just think about it, you're reliving it, depending on the severity. Me, diagnosed PTSD around that, that, would, that was a major trigger for me. I couldn't just think about dad's death. I was reliving it every damn time. And it would send me down a rabbit hole. I would, be, I would have panic attacks, I would black out, like all these things, I, I couldn't just talk about it. But these substances and this type of work allowed me to like, here's Chase and here's life, here's this problem, here's this trauma, completely come around and just look at it. And that alone gave me such relief of, I could think about something that I, I genuinely, I wanna work through, but it's just so painful. And the pain and the fear of working on that pain was so, it was, it just overcame me that I couldn't even think about like, how do I detach from that? Yeah. But these things allowed me to detach and look at it objectively. And again, I look at the literature, look at the research. May was working in it and she would tell me all these things with people. You so know. you're not just like taking random stuff from people. You're like, what am I taking? How much am I, oh, yeah. how much am I taking? What is so it I went and worked with my therapist. They're like, hey, I'm coming in because I want to work through my PTSD. I want to, I want to be able, Sounds weird to say this, but like, I want to get over dad's death. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to move on with my life because I know that's what he would want for me. And like, I, I feel like as far as I've come, I still have a, a ball and chain. Yeah. And I just been adding links to that chain, links to that chain. And like, it looks like I'm getting better, but I'm still connected and there's still something holding me down. And I was like, I want to come in. This is my intention. So I had therapy sessions. We really got clear. So I had traditional therapy and then we did the ketamine assisted therapy and imagine like the most like zen yoga room vibey like just like cozy warm center you ever could um so you do your therapy you go in uh the medical provider in this case my wife walks up and she like injects me in the arm she's like have a nice trip baby uh and like and she's like by the way i want spaghetti when we get when you're done <laughs> yeah you still have to make dinner uh, and i will say i mean it's, it's very very hard and we can keep going, but I, I'll say this, I will, long story short, this as best as possible. And I've told you about this experience before. Yeah. Um, and this is again, unique to my experience. Uh, and the experience that I had, especially in the first and second sessions are very, very unique in the ketamine therapy world. And I say that because I want to just, people that are maybe listening and you can relate in any way. This was 17 years later. So it had been 17 years since our dad passed away. 
And I spent the next 10 to 12 brushing everything under the rug. And only at that point, like 2015, 16, decided to really kind of take this on. Um, so there's years of work of getting ready to fully surrender to this type of experience, this type of therapy. And in my first experience and in my second experience, I died. Complete, I separated from my body, became just my conscious being, uh, and I was reunited with our dead father. And in a way, it was like the main thing I was looking for because even though I was home on emergency leave when he was literally about to pass away and ultimately he passed, like I, it's almost like he was waiting to die without me there. I, I came home multiple times, I went to the hospital multiple times, and it's like he was so close to dying, but yeah. he's like, it's like Chase, you can't be here for this. Yeah. And so I never got to say goodbye. And this ketamine trip. So I was, my experience was I was reunited with him and it was like, there was no pain. It wasn't like, oh my God, dad, like why, why, why? It was just, yo, what's up? We're back. Like, so it wasn't like the end of Interstellar where it's like screaming through the bookcase kind of thing. I did have an Interstellar moment. Yeah. It's funny you say that. My second journey, so when dad passed away, uh, I wasn't there, but I wound up coming back to the hospital that morning. Yeah. And there was, uh, he was in the bed. There was our family friend, Carrie Robinson, who drove me to the hospital from, picked me up from the house. Brittany, our sister, her friend, Julie, a nurse, Rhonda, our stepmom, and then me standing right over here between him and the bed in this window. I don't know if you remember this or know this, but he, you know, he was bedridden. He was in the hospital for the last like four yeah. months of his life, uh, completely relying on machines. And with ALS, it's really, it fucking sucks, but also like the mind is still there. Yeah. So he would still kind of like, if he wasn't all hopped up on pain meds and stuff, you know, he can move his eyes and look and stuff. And there was like this constellation that he would like look at. He was always looking out this window, at the, through the window, looking up at the stars like this. And in my second experience, I had that interstellar moment where it's wild. Like, like, see, this is what's crazy. Like right now, a moment like this before, like I would be bawling, but like, I'm so excited to tell this. Yeah. I had this moment where I was reunited with him and the whole time during my journey, it was just bright burning white light. Like his, his energy, his bearing, his spe spirit, Are you floating whatever. through space at this point? Flying through space and time. What? Like it's me and dad, you were, I told you it's, I'm getting off on a tangent, but like you, you called the next day. And I was like, bro, you were in my experience. I was reunited with him and that bright white light all of a sudden became so much more intense. And then it re like, I realized like these lights here, I realized like it was us in this moment looking down I had a clear shot of being in the cosmos. I know this sounds crazy. I looked down into that window at him the moment that he died. He told me goodbye. On this trip. So it's, it's like, like it's he, clo it's closure. Yeah, it's like, Chase, you weren't supposed to be here physically when I passed because this moment, like, that already happened. Like he passed away 17 years ago, yeah. looking out. And then now 17 years in the future, we're having that moment where he's looking out to coming down. I mean, it's kind of crazy, man. It, it's one of those I things know, it like, sounds wild. I, it, it, it sounds, I'm in my head, I'm like, nah, that didn't fucking happen. Yeah. Like, like, you know. It is, it was imprinted on me as real as you and I here are now today. And I, the important thing is with these therapies or any type of experience like that you have in any kind of therapy, when you walk away believing something that intense, your life has changed. And this all happened in like 30 minutes or an hour? About an hour. That's crazy. I, yeah. I, so I don't personally have an experience in this stuff. People did in high school call me a mushroom because I was a fun guy. But, you know. Oh, that's just because you had a bunch of Fremonda cheese. <laughs> What'd you call me? <laughs> so, I, you know, on the, on the kind of the topic of, uh, of that, um, I want to kind of wrap up this podcast. Yeah. Talking a little bit about dad. Um, so if people are newer to the podcast... Um, our father passed away in 2005, January 22nd, January 22nd, um, from ALS, you know, what ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Yes. And it's a real bitch. It sucks. Yeah. And so I was 15 years old, um, mm. when it happened and I, the problem I have with, uh, dad's 
passing is I don't remember shit. Like I don't remember. Yeah. I, I, I always tell the story of like, I think he like told me like after he started showing symptoms, but like I, but you being the older, the oldest child, can you kind of explain like the, the moment he told you he had this illness? Mm -hmm. Cause I don't like the, when, like, how long did he have it in my head? I was like, it was a shorter, like three to five years before he passed. But like, what was it like? Like, what did he say to you? You remember our Christmas trip? Went to New York? Went to New York City. So he knew at that time. And so did our stepmom. I don't know if our- What year was that? That was 2003. I had just, it was my first time back from the army. So dad passed in like three years from ALS? He was diagnosed in 2003, had an 18 month, but now, did, did, did he ever tell you kind of like, like, were there symptoms? Like, like, how, how, how do you yeah. just go in? Like, I'm going in for my, my prostate exam. You have ALS. Like, yeah. well, you know, like, how, how do they? So what happened with him, and this, this is just my, my angle. Um, so I left in July, 2003 for boot camp. And he was always writing me letters, just, you know, like so many, like I got letters from you, from Brittany, from all of our friends and family. Uh, and somewhere around the line of like, maybe like month one going into two, uh, his letters became less. Yeah. And, and, or, or another family member of ours would be like, you know, hey, dad says, hey, or he's writing me about this. And he has a doctor's appointment. He has another doctor's appointment. He has a doctor's appointment. Um, I was like, that's weird. Um, so again, only stitching this together after the fact, uh, what happened was he was noticing some like small difficulties in like swallowing and speaking, kind of just having like throat and mouth, like muscular issues. Like it's more difficult for me to like, I'm having to swallow. I'm having to like really think about how I'm talking and like thinking to move my mouth and everything. Uh, and like, it was like, this is weird. So he went in, they did some tests, did some neurological tests, things weren't like, I don't, they're like, I don't know. And then one doctor was just like, you know what? It could be this thing. Let's test for this. How do you test for that? Uh, it's a neurological test. Yeah. What, what I, I, so when it comes to like certain neurological tests that you can basically like, and I know this because right after he passed, like I was like, am I gonna get this? And I went and got every test that I could. Yeah. Uh, like certain tests they'll do it basically just like go to like the top of a nerve, the beginning of a nerve and like, it, you're basically getting electrocuted. Yeah. So they're testing every nerve that you have in different muscular systems uh, to see like, are the nerves communicating to each other where is it shorting? Where is it stopping? Um, where is maybe where are nerves dying? And anytime there's a nerve that's dying, that's a very very bad thing because all nerve systems, your central nervous system, goes back to the brain. Yeah. Anytime there's a central nervous system, especially autoimmune, it's like this is a big red flag. So he went in. The doctor was like, "There's this one other test. Let's do this test." Unfortunately, came back positive for ALS. And so my belief is that from about July. Yeah, like August, September, maybe. Um, I'm trying to think, because I graduated boot camp in like, I think it was like September, October. Um, like he knew. Yeah. He knew. And they knew. And the doctor's like, you have ALS, like you're going to die. Yeah, it's terminal. Uh, it's really tricky with ALS. They can't say like two months, yeah. 10 years, because some people pass away in two months and people like Richard Hawkins, you know, go on for like decades. Um, but he's like, this is a death sentence. Um, and then we did the, I came home for the first time from the military. We all went the family trip to New York city for Christmas. And my memory is right at the end of that, like they explained he's like, you know, Hey, here's what's going on. I got this diagnosis. Dad just set you down or, uh, yeah. Yeah. How did you take that? Well, were you like, what? They, he didn't like, present, they didn't present it at the time. Who, him, who's they? What him and our stepmom. Okay. Okay. It was you, me, our sister yeah. and Rhonda. Um, and, uh, they told me like, you know, hey, you know, here's why, here's all the doctor's appointments, you know, got this diagnosis, what's going on. Um, and they're kind of like, you know, we're, they really padded it. Yeah. Um, we're working with doctors, we're going through well, all you, this you stuff. Know, you don't wanna and, tell your, your kid to be like, I had this, I don't know when I'm gonna die, yeah. but I'm gonna die. Like, it's- I was like, oh, okay, well, like, oh, well, like nobody likes to hear like a family member or loved one or anybody that's, you know, sick, or whatever. But it wasn't until after that, that I, I, I began to like look it up and research and everything. I remember, I went home from leave back and I realized like, I found out like, oh, this is it. Yeah, this like, is this is this a big is deal. It. Yeah, yeah. And it like, at that moment, I'll never forget, like I was on a phone call with dad and Rhonda 
and I was in the laundry room of my barracks at the time with the lights off, crying, and more or less threatening, like, I'm out, like I'm yeah. leaving the military, I'm coming out, like I'm dropping hardship paperwork, like I'm gonna prove my family needs me more, like I'm not gonna be away during this time. Like I, I, I don't want the next time I see my dad to be in a casket. Yeah. And uh, like a week later, if that, like he literally the last couple of days that he could walk on his own, he flew out to visit me where I was stationed in Monterey at the time. He spent four days with me, I used to say like convincing me not to leave the military. Yeah. But again, like theme of what we've been talking about here is like he presented to me choices and consequences. Yeah. And he's like, Chase, this sucks. You're like, I'm, yeah, yeah. He's like, this sucks, but I don't want your life to stop to, to I don't want your life to not have a start just because mine is ending. Yeah. And he's like, you have so much ahead of you. And like, I'm gonna fight this, I'm gonna do everything we can. And like, I'm gonna be open with you. And he's like, you have every choice, you have every right to do whatever you want with your life. But like, don't give this up. Don't stop your life from starting just because mine is ending. And I decided to stay in. And then unfortunately, he had a really escalated case from diagnosis to when he passed was right about 18 months. Um, and See, he I, didn't, got, I didn't even know it was that fat. I mean, that's, yeah. When he was diagnosed and uh, right after that New York City trip, um, and he just got worse and worse and worse. It was only yeah. like a couple months later, he was completely wheelchair bound. A few months yeah. later, he was in you know the hospital, I, I, care. What The biggest painful memory is like, I remember dad, we were at the blue house. Yeah. yeah. And I remember him sitting me down at the table and like telling me mm. that the disease. And, uh, you know, I'm like 14 or, you know, yeah. And I like, it's like, he told me that he was like, and it, like he told me and I was like, okay. Mm. And then he's like, he's like, like, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. And I, I like, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Like I, I was just like, yeah. oh, oh, like, wow. Like that's bad. Like, and I, I just like, I couldn't process mm what that really meant. And I remember, um, and I remember even visiting dad when he was in the hospital. So if people don't know ALS, you know, it's a degenerative disease, you know, attacks everything. And you know, you your lose muscles your muscles atrophy entirely. Yeah. You become a prisoner in your own body. Your mind is completely fine. Yeah. I, yeah. You're, I mean, you, you lose your ability to walk, talk, uh, speak, go to the bathroom. I mean, you're just Breathe, a, this, this body. And you know, at some point, um, you know, it, Dad's just slur like mumbling, yeah, just just, just uh, yeah yeah like just. I would come home on sometimes when I would have leave and I, I I would spoon feed him like baby food. And I remember I was in the hospital one time. One of the few memories, and it just fucking sucks because I like I wish I had, you know, I wish I spent more time. And uh, so, it's like I I remember, like you know, it was just me and him like in the hospital, like just me and him, and. Uh, it's like I was talking to him about it and he would like mumble and try to like do something. And like I couldn't, I didn't understand what he wanted, you know? And I was like, I was like, I, 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 I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Like it, it was like trying to tell me something. I was like, I don't know what the fuck my dad's saying, man. And, uh, <sighs> you know, it, 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 it's crazy. And, uh, you know, even when, when dad passed, I remember my mom, our mom, uh, <laughs> mom and her fiance at the time, yeah. George, coming in, crying in my room, coming in and sitting down saying, your father passed away. Yeah. And I didn't shed a tear. I, I was just like, okay. And I, I don't know why. Cause now I think about that and I start fucking breaking down, man. And like, I don't know why this age, that I just couldn't process that like my dad was dying, my dad died. Um, and and you had a lot of experiences with him, you know, in his, you you were with him a lot more than I was. And like, you know, you, you, you can't go back and, you know, change stuff. But like, literally, whenever people ask like my biggest regret in my life is like, I didn't spend more time with him, uh, you know, when he was sick. 
And it's like, I don't know why I was in fucking Richmond. I'm like, why the fuck was I in Richmond? You know, like, why, why wasn't I like, you're being a 14 year old, 15 year old kid. Man. Yeah. It, it just, going. it sucks, man. And, uh, I like to think, you know, all the time with, uh, just like the positive memories of dad. And it sucks because it's like, I, I want to think at 15, I could have remember so much, but I have, I have these like just faint memories of dad. Like I remember going to the skate park, him yelling at me, riding on the lawnmower, <laughs> him, me, him being like, Max, did you use Sharpie marker and draw on grandma's basement floor? Me going no and blaming it on the literal cats and him dragging my ass down to the basement and me going, it's the fucking cats, dad. And I like, curse, but like him going, Max, like almost like you stupid, like the cats <laughs> did this. And you know, like I, I remember these things, but like, mm. but then it's just like, it, it's like they come and go. And I, I, there's so much I can't remember. And even when he was sick, as I remember him telling me, I remember being in the hospital and then I remember being as like at his funeral. And it's like, I can't like remember anything. Like I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's trauma, man. And it's like one of those things like I, I wish, and uh, I try to stay there like the good positive memories, but it's like I'm, a lot of times I'm like, I don't, can't remember. Like mm -hmm. I can't remember. And uh, it just. It's it, our default to suppress and to block and to protect. Yeah, and, and and what's interesting, you you said this kind of a lot, is that like, I don't know how you worded this, because I've, I've tried explaining it, I think maybe to someone, but I, I was like, I'm gonna say it wrong, and I'm gonna, like, it's not what I mean. But you said something of like, dad's passing, like, allowed, like, our lives have changed because of dad's passing. And in a million years, I, I think of that and I'm like, I would give all this shit up mm. to have dad back. All of it. But like, I understand what you're saying. Like literally, like dad dying changed our entire lives. And it's like, and it's so shit that like that had to happen. It sucks. Yeah, and it's like, and it's just, it's so fucking terrible and it's like true though. And I don't know how to like react to that comment or react to that statement or to like acknowledge it. And I don't know what like to do with it, but it's just, it's, it's an interesting way to like think about it. And I, I try, that's why anyone, um, there's actually been a, there's been a, a couple that has come to this gym years ago and, uh, they, the husband, uh, has ALS. Mm. Years have gone by. They came to Alpha Land. He's still in a wheelchair. And I, I like, I can't even talk to this man without just breaking down. Like, I'm like, I, it's, it's, they're almost like, oh, they're here. Like, talk to him. I'm like, and almost like in a, yeah. in a dick way, I'm like, I, I can't talk. I can't talk to them. I can't. Yeah. Cause I'm gonna see them and I'm gonna see my dad and I'm gonna break down. And then, like, and I'm talking to this person. And I'm like, you're gonna die, man. Like, I, like, and it's, and, it, it, it's it's almost like I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of going on this tangent here, no, I mean, but uh, thank you. It's just thank like you. it's crazy, man. And uh, here's I'll, here's what I'll say to that if I can say something. Yeah, this sounds really, really, really wild and maybe fucked up, but I am at a place now in my healing from this. I have gratitude for his death. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, of course, I would love for him to be here. I would love for our stepmom to still have her husband. I would love for the community to still have this man. I, but it's like, there's a lot of self and ego that is embedded in other people's journeys. And especially when their journey ends of like, how dare you? I'm mad at the system. Why couldn't have you been healthier? Why, why all these things? We're grasping for straws. We're grasping for meaning. We're grasping for hope. And then ultimately it falls back on us too of like, I should have spent more time. I should have this, should have that. Like there are a lot of times I still pass. I'm like, I wish I should have left the military. I should have just been more with my family. I should have been more of a brother. Um, but it's like you have, you will get to a time and a place. Everybody will get to a time and a place to where you can realize how much of yourself is embedded in 
the other person's loss yeah. of them literally not being here. And when we work on that, it allows us to detach in a way, again, like I said earlier, that you never thought was possible. I never thought this kind of healing or even just feeling a uh, uh, 10% less of pain was even possible. But things happen and you do. And I, and I choose, and again, it's a choice. I choose to look at the life that I have. I choose to look like I know you do at the life that you have because of, because of that. I mean, it sucks and like, I don't know if we'll ever really fully understand why, but like if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be living the life of joy and fulfillment and meaning that we have now. And yeah. you wouldn't be supporting so many other people and touching the lives of so many other people. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without all of that. And it's like, cool, like couldn't we have come up with anything else to do with our life? Sure, but like it's because of that meaning that we will never stop what we're doing. And that is the ultimate way that I know dad will live on with us. I want to hear some crazy shit. Lay it on me. Is uh, I recently had, and this is, I know we're, we're going to, this is going to be the long, longest podcast. Um, this is honestly good for me. Honestly. I have no plans, man. Um, Dude, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> and uh, I love you. I love you, man. And uh, you know, something that I've, I recently had a, uh, like a breakdown with uh, Taylor. You know, as Taylor and I get more and more serious, we, uh, we talk about like, you know, how in the future, you know, kids, right? And uh, something that I've, I've never told anyone, let alone, like she was the first person I told, and now I was like kind of telling the world here, but like, I told her, I kept having to say like this timeline of like, I was like, oh, like I want to wait to have kids until like 35. Like I was like 35. And the reason, <laughs> the reason why I like wait, I, I have a lot of business goals I want to, I want to hit, but like, and I, I, f I feel like you might agree with me, but like my biggest fear in life is that I'm going to get ALS. And, uh, but I think, <laughs> I think the biggest fear I have and this is why I want to wait till 35 is that like, I'm so afraid that I'm going to have a kid and I'm going to, I'm going to die and I have to like give him, like give him or her like the heartbreak of that I'm dealing with. And I'm like, it, it, it doesn't make sense. But like, I literally want to wait till 35, like to, to make sure that I don't get an illness by 35. Like just like literally like my biggest fear is to have a kid. Like that's why a lot of times I like didn't want to have kid children yeah, because yeah. I was like, if I don't have kids, because I just I just, in my life they, I, they I can't have this pain. I literally am like, I'm going to get a, a, a the terminal illness in my life. I don't know why I think that, but I'm just like, it's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know I don't know why, and I, I'm scared of getting ALS. I'm well, we know why it's because this has been our history. Yeah, and, and and it's not hereditary, but it's just like this is our truth. Yeah, and and that's like why I never wanted to have kids because I was like, if I don't have kids, then when I potentially get a terminal illness, like they don't have to lose their father. Mm. So like, that was like my mindset. I'm like, if I don't have kids, I, they don't have to lose their father. And it's like, you can't go through life, like scared. You're going to get a terminal yeah. illness. But like, but like, that's literally like my fear of having children is that like, I'm going to get sick at some point in my life. Yeah. And like my kids are going to have to like lose me. And I don't know if that's like a, a, I don't think selfish is the right word, but like I just, I don't know if it's like a scared way to live, but like mm. I just, I think throughout my entire life, I've always had a, uh, of course this shit happened to me type of like mindset. Oh, like yeah, yeah, something yeah, bad yeah. happens, I'm like, of course that Black happened to me. To yeah, life, I'm like, yeah. of course it happened to me. And like, it's, I live a very privileged, great life right now. And it's like, you know, so it's hard to, you know, have this mindset. But in my head, like the back of my head, I was like, I just, I'm like, I'm going to be the guy that, and I'm going to get ALS. Yeah. And it's like the fucking worst fear of my life, man. I, I'm i with you, man. I've been there. And um, well, first of all, thank you for saying all that. Like, I know how hard it is to talk about this stuff. And I know how hard, despite this situation, any situation where like you're coming to terms for, for and with your own self of what I'm actually most afraid of in life and the thing that I'm most fearful of even thinking and saying out loud, like, that takes tremendous courage. So like, 
I commend you for that and I thank you for that. Um, but I'll say if it's any comfort whatsoever, being four years further down the line with you on all of this, there are a lot of things that come with time and a lot of things that come with intentional work plus time. I had that same fear as well. And especially being four years further down the line, like, yo, I'm about to be 37. Dad passed away at 43. I am so worried and unsure and anxious about what am I gonna look like at 43 in a day? Yeah. I will have surpassed my father. And so when I kind of began to realize that, that the future is coming, knock on wood, you know, like I'm healthy, I'm still here on this side of the ground every day, um, of, Am I going to make it to 43 like him? Am I going to get this disease? Am I going to get this terminal, this horrible illness? It has shed from that into the healing that I've had and the hope that I have been able to find and develop now to my greatest fear is not getting this disease, is not dying. And my greatest fear is not getting this disease with a family or with a child or children. It is not preparing them for something like this. And so it has been this shift from, again, and it's weird, like me, the self of, I'm worried about this fear because if I die and it's gonna do this for all these other people, like we are still at the center of that. Yeah. So what can That's we- That's why I was thinking, I was like, it's like a self, it's like, I was like, is it selfish? Yeah. But it's not wrong. It's your fear and your truth and no one can ever well, tell it's, you it's, it's more, I'm like, it's, I'm like, I, I'm so afraid I'm gonna get a thing because I'm like, I don't, that's why like, I almost like get out of relationships because I was like, sure. I don't want to potentially get a disease yeah. and- Put anybody else through like, that pain I, I don't suffering. want, yeah, Taylor, I don't want you yeah. to have to go through fucking feeding me. I don't want like my kid, like, I was like, and so if I die a fucking loan mm. with no kids, I don't have to, one, that percent chance mm. that I could have to put that pain onto someone else. And it's like, and it's a dumb thing to think, man. No, it's not, no, it's not. No, it's and not. it's like- No, it's not. I say like, shit. It's not dumb, it's not dumb. Um. Dude, if I get like a like a like a twitch in my arm sometimes, <laughs> I'm like, this is it. Oh, I, not to laugh at that, but like, you know, I'm still there too. Like sometimes I'll have like a weird muscle spasm. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah. I um, I was I, I, I was at a party in the hills, uh, sober this time. Uh, it was like drinking. Sounds drink, lame. <laughs> drinking like a vodka soda or something. Um, and I was with this person, and this. And it's little benchmarks like this that, again, especially when it comes to like emotional pain, um, it's hard to measure success. It's hard, really hard to measure progress. You know, we can level up in the gym, add 10 weight, PR, whatever, like, and that's like quantifiable. Emotional pain is very, very different and very, very relative. I was having this conversation with this person and she mentioned something about like, she found out, excuse me, like a friend or family member like was terminal. And in that scenario in the past, like it would immediately, I would hear that word and I would like lock up and like, like you, like go down this rabbit hole, pain and suffering. But it was so unique and weird in that moment, the entire experience of what would happen when someone's terminal, like basically from diagnosis to death, I like rationalized and like went through and realized, and I got to the end of it and I was okay. Yeah. Like I was able for the first time in ever relive the most traumatic event in my life and get to the end of that like I always do, but instead this time it was rationalized. It was like, oh, that happens. And I was able to still stay at the party. I was able to still talk to this person and I was able to go home and not die on the inside or become a useless human being for the next several days. And that was like a godsend. Yeah. I was like, I'm getting better. I'm getting better, I'm getting better. And that is one of many benchmarks that I've had through speaking this truth and speaking this pain and yeah. sharing the ever forward message on the podcast and in real life. The more that I, and I would, big brother had here, man, like compel you in your own way and in your own time, run towards that. One step forward, walk towards it the more that we walk towards and revisit and embody this experience as an experience that was a part of our life, the part of our, a part of our family, and not something that we were forced or subjected to endure, and we can remove that blame, 
the pain goes away, the understanding comes, the gratitude comes, the objective perspective comes. And then again, my experience, that is what has helped me get to the point of like, yo, bro, like I love my life and I love my wife and I love my family and I cannot wait to have kids. And that's always been there, but I've always been, what if I die the same way? Now, like I'm not worried at all. I have accepted death. Like I could, God forbid, walk out, get hit by a bus tomorrow. If that should be my path, if a terminal illness falls upon me, if illness falls upon me, I am okay with that. And it's because I know that I am now com more compelled to prepare myself and to prepare my family for the hard truth that everything ends. Yeah life ends we are here one day and gone another unfortunately the circumstances in which that happens can be less pleasant than others but it's like oh it's i don't know maybe i'm getting closer you know may and i were actually like literally talking about starting to have kids and so it's becoming more of a reality and so i'm actually going from hypothetical to right, how how am i going to raise my kids yeah that, uh, that's like, awesome she's gonna let you have sex too one day one day one day i can't do it every time <laughs> i can't i have to get there no, like she's probably just like, you know, just like put it in a cup. We're going to go to the, go to the lab. Um, but I mean, you know, it's, there's so much to this and the journey is never ending, but I, I can tell you, like, I have gotten so much of my life back through just having just a, having hard conversations like this and no longer keeping inside of me and having an incredible partner in my life, such as May. And it sounds like you with Taylor of like, just the way that when it's just you, it's just you. But when you have a partner or somebody in your life that like, it's not like, you know, tell me more, give me more, but just their presence and being themselves compels us to the point of safety, of trust. Like, I want to tell you this thing that I'm afraid yeah. of. Like, you're on the path, man. And like, I'm so happy for you now to be in a happy relationship. Um, I'm so happy for you to have a, a partner and a person to like share this stuff with because of like the partnership aspect, but also like, again, being on the other side of this type of healing, like this is what has helped me the most. And everybody's journey is totally different, but like sharing things publicly on a podcast, social media, in therapy, but with my partner, like what you're doing has put me down the path of so many other realizations and more work, there's more work involved, but like, I mean, it's just, the human potential never ceases to blow my mind, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And uh, now, you know, I've gone through so much of the physical stuff like you, you know, finding fitness and finding health and wellness. Um, it shows us what we're capable of. And now we got this. And you know, now I really think, and when I was your age, quite literally now this time was when I really was like, let me dump all in, let me dive all in to this other stuff yeah. um, because I have the strong foundation. Um, so, well, I'm glad dude, to that, I mean, seeing you where you are now mentally um just talking back you know with dad i remember years ago you not being in this place and breaking down and talking about it and now the fact that like i still break down every time and like you can keep it's a straight okay. face like i'm like i i see it in you that i'm like he's at a different place than i am and it's like i want to get there mm. and i want to get there um and it's you know little baby steps man and uh you know I think having our good relationship and our good bond has been so impactful and um, more like gold bond, right? We were like gold bond, dude. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, can we yeah. ever not, not be, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, it, but tying it all back in you having that deeper thought and stuff is, uh, is just like amazing to see mm -hmm. and how you kind of look at life differently than I do and take things a little bit more seriously. And it's, uh, it's inspiring to, to to see kind of the path that you're on, man. And um, likewise, bro. What uh, you know, to kind of to get off the topic of <laughs> terminal illnesses, uh, <laughs> to wrap it up, man. Like, what, what's what's next for you? And like, kind of a quick summary. Um, I mean, I still pour my heart, my soul into what I do and Everford Radio and just the relationships that I build through that process. But um, I'm really, 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 I'm in just, and this is gonna sound so LA, uh, I'm in the most surrender, P 
period of my life right now. Yeah. I'm just surrendering to like, I am so aware and confident of who I am, what I hold true, my values, my mission, like meaning to me and what's important to me and my family. Um, you are a part of that and like nothing else matters, but I, I'm so stronghold in that I'm just surrendering to whatever else, you know, life has in store for me. And um, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunities that I have right now and truly just open to what comes next. And I am just so a sponge and aware of an opportunity, of an experience, of business, of joy, fulfillment, um, that I am just eager to just jump on whatever. But so, I mean, long-winded way of saying Everford Radio is my main baby. That's what I do. And that's that's my biggest goal and driver in life. Yeah. Um, working on a book, started writing a book this year. Um, a lot of shit. Yeah, man. But just, you know, tapping into what's possible more and more. Well, that's awesome, man. I uh, I hope people really got a, a deeper insight into, you know, our our backstory. You Get as your Kleenex. An, yeah, you as Get an individual. Kleenex. And um, yeah, I think this was uh, really cool and hopefully impactful for a lot of people. Mm. Very different towards the second half. But um, yeah, man, I, I want to wrap this up and, and thank you for, you know, being on, we'll have to continue to do this. Yeah. I know this, I, I have a feeling that we, this, I don't know Did if a lot of stuff. the internet on this? Well, I, 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 I've, I've got a feeling these cameras like cut out <laughs> at some point or something. Oz has been, been in here a whole bunch. So I'm just like, God, this whole. See, whole, this is why you got a good podcast. Second half. Uh, oh my, all right, my mom's on here. What? Our mom. <laughs> we got our, we, Hi, got, mom. we got mother on here. <laughs> mom, this podcast is already like two and a half hours. I got, can I call you in a minute? <laughs> You're coming on the podcast soon. We want to sing on your podcast. Okay, sing happy birthday. All right, and we are at a restaurant, so everyone's going to hear. Okay. Everyone ready? Yep. Happy birthday. Did she call you? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Max. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Thank you so much. I didn't know it was your birthday. Yeah. Thank you, Mom. I love you. I, I will call you back. In like 30 minutes. Wait, is that your mom or my mom? All of our moms. Cool. I love you. Love you and Chase. <laughs> and Chase, yeah, don't forget that. But uh, well, everyone, guys, I hope you enjoy yeah. this episode. Everything that Chase does, all of his his podcasts, his services, um, everything, even the stuff we didn't get to mention will be down in the description. Please make sure to check it out. Check out my OnlyFans too. You start OnlyFans too? <laughs> no. God damn, dude. I'm starting an OnlyFeet. But that will conclude episode number 18. Every time I say like the longest episode, the next episode is like the longest episode. But please leave a comment down below if you're watching this on YouTube. Subscribe, hit the notification bell. We drop videos every single Monday at 9 a.m. unless we don't. <laughs> and if you're watching, listen to this on a podcast streaming platform of your choice, make sure you give us a five-star review. I have no idea what that does, but it does, cool, does look it cool. It does things. It does things. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, eat more sour strips. What is, what is that? And ever forward. That's weird. That's I have to pee. Me too. So bad. Did these cameras mess up or they're going? Nothing. What? That was a fucking episode, bro. That was some fire, dude. Huh? Ah. That was some real life shit. I, have to, I, I might, I almost peed my pants. I, it's starting to go back inside my body right now. Uh, just suck it back up. <laughs> it like hurts the stand. Oh, uh, hey, man. Oh. oh. Thank you. All right. Let's go read some books. Yeah.